Hello friends. This is Muse Fanfictions. How are you all? So in this video, we will see the third part of what if Naruto had iron release. But before we start, if you want more stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe and like this video, and if possible share this video with your friends. Now let's start the story. Kiri Civil War. Year 1. Senma Ambush Aftermath. While the third company celebrated the first rebel victory, the first company had cautiously set up camp in what appeared to be an abandoned city Atari, the fourth largest on the mainland island of Mizu no Kuni in a hop, skip and a jump from Ohm Island. May was busy setting up a base of operations in the heart of the city when her advance scouts reported to the main command tent. Report, Lieutenant, she stated authoritatively. Yes, May Shusho. There are no foreign chakra signatures for miles. All the storehouses for food and weapons have been totally obliterated, as well as factories. It seems that there was a careful, organized evacuation of everyone and all their useful belongings long before we arrived here. Even the restaurants and homes are empty. Damn. They knew we were coming somehow. Dismissed. I hope this doesn't mean what I think it means. The soldier bowed and ran off. May turned to Ao and Chojuro, who were consulting a map nearby. I see no reason for us to settle here. There are no resources for us to take advantage of and we are far more vulnerable in these narrow streets. It's imperative that we take Oko Railroad, which will give us a fast mode of transportation to our next target, Soza. What do you two think? I agree wholeheartedly, Ao responded. We have nothing to gain from remaining here. Let's start off as soon as possible. But do we even have a concrete plan? I don't think it's a good idea to go in with a plan that isn't well thought out, Chojuro argued nervously. I absolutely insist that we go. I can hardly believe that our enemies would leave no traps here whatsoever. If we were to be ambushed now, we wouldn't be able to make any plan at all. We can leave and formulate a sufficient plan when the time comes. No, Chojuro has a point, May decided after rubbing her chin for a bit. I sense that had they been planning a trap, they would have either pre-set it or have sprung it while we were settling in. It's likely their evacuation, although thorough, was not as organized or foreseen as our scouts think it to have been, so they did not have enough time to spare to set up an elaborate ambush. We've been here for several hours now, so I believe we're safe. The other two in the room noted that Ao, for whatever reason, was positively fuming. However, he refrained from blurting out anything out of order out of respect for his commander. As you wish, May Shusho. What would you have us do now? The commander glanced outside the opening in the tent to see the lower half of the sun leaving a rosy tide sprawled throughout the sky. Had her thoughts not been on how she could kill other humans most effectively, she might have even reflected on the world's tremendous beauty. Night will fall soon. Ow, gather Rakan Team Alpha here. The basic scouts won't do for this mission. You will lead the team on an expedition to acquire specific information about Oko Railroad schedule logs, cargo, number of trains, number of cars per train, number of stations, everything. Go. Yes, mom. Ao bowed and shunshined away. The most beautiful woman in Mizu no Kuni sighed. He's always been so headstrong. Two bodies lay cuddled up together under the warmth of a few soft blankets. Haku's head was nestled into Naruto's neck and her left arm lay across his chest. His left arm was holding her tight to his side while he lay on his back. They had retreated to one of the remotest ships in the fleet, and with a little persuasion from the lieutenant general, they had gotten the main cabin all to themselves. You're so warm, Naruto-kun, the girl cooed and snuggled up closer to him. You're way warmer. You feel so good, come closer, he replied in the gentlest voice possible. Haku was already nearly overwhelmed with the fact that she was cuddling with the shirtless young man she was so attracted to, and on top of that he was being incredibly sweet. She blushed even deeper than she had been and allowed herself to relax and squeeze every drop of bliss she could from the moment, like an amazing dream one never wants to wake up from. After a few minutes, the boy slowly leaned his head over and began kissing her cheek. He ever so subtly moved his kisses left, and soon they locked lips. This wasn't their first time. So Haku knew to get on top of her lover and straddle him to make it not only easier but much hotter. The soft pecks quickened and deepened at the same pace that Naruto's hands were moving down her back. The feeling of his soft hands squeezing her ass still sent chills through her body. He did it perfectly hell, everything he did was perfect. If he wanted to turn her on, he knew precisely how to do it, 
and in seconds she would be putty in his hands. Presently, Naruto flipped her over so that he was on top and began intensely kissing her neck. He continued the grinding so that his cock, which was rock hard by now, could clearly be felt rubbing against her cunt. These combined launched her into an indescribable bliss. She had already been moaning but now she couldn't help but call his name. Oh, baby, please don't stop. Oh, Kami, keep grinding Naruto-kun please. The voice she let this out in was the sexiest the young man had ever heard, which only made him more turned on. He started going lower, below her neck to her collarbone, then her upper chest, and started to take off the shirt she had on. Naruto-kun, we both just turned 13. It's still too soon, she whispered almost apologetically. The lieutenant general couldn't help but sigh. You're right, of course. I'm sorry, I just got caught up, he responded softly as he reached up to plant a soft kiss on her lips. I know, baby, I know. We should probably get going, we don't want Jay suspecting anything. If he doesn't already, that is. The kunoichi nodded in agreement and they both stood up. Naruto gave her rubbed one of her soft cheeks with his thumb, got one last deep kiss and one last squeeze of her ass, and was gone. Haku watched him go with a tinge of sadness. I wish we could stay together forever. I think I'm in love. Meanwhile, Naruto shook his head and spat as he ran. I swear to Kami, if that bitch doesn't give me head soon, I'm dropping this whole shit. Several hours later, Naruto stood in the cellar of one of the several ships used to hold POWs, prisoners of war. The woman strapped to the chair in front of him was of Jonin rank, a centurion high enough rank to know roughly what was going on in the Loyalist army, but not high enough to virtually guarantee an unsuccessful interrogation. She was very, very attractive her eyes were a full blue, and her hair was long, silky smooth, and nearly black. The way it fell across her face blocked one side of it, giving her a look like maze in other words, a very sexy one. Her breasts were at least a c, nearly d. I don't have time to waste on basic measures which I know will be ineffective. I will destroy your psyche if need be, the lieutenant general whispered. He had requested to be alone with the prisoner. Naruto had known mere punching would not be enough, on top of being annoying. Fuck you, the prisoner spat out. The interrogator sighed. These are the moments when I wish Itachi Sensei had been assigned to our company. But I have my own methods. I just hope I don't fuck this up and kill her. Several incredibly minuscule, nearly invisible specks of iron dust floated out from Naruto's hand. They sunk into the prisoner's pores. I strongly suggest you talk now. This will be the most painful experience of your life, with no hope of passing out, he stated seriously and gestured to the IV drip hooked up to the Jonin, which was full of adrenaline. I'll never tell you shit. Go fuck yourself. Your eloquence is commendable, as is your stupidity. Try not to scream too loudly, as this is quite a small room, and the walls do nothing to absorb the sound, they just rebound it. I say that, but I know you'll be screaming incredibly loudly. Naruto had been conducting a painstakingly thorough study of human anatomy for as long as he could remember. After all, just as a demolition expert must know the blueprints of a building in order to most efficiently take it down, so an assassin or interrogator should know the anatomy of the human body in order to effect the best kill or extract the most information. His research led him to many interesting findings, but none as remarkable as this the area of the brain which caused the sensation of pain. He had recently discovered the ability of his iron to manipulate lightning to an impressive extent he could charge the iron with certain amounts of chakra to have it absorb lightning, reflect lightning, and even potentially conduct the lightning then shoot it back out with a range and voltage exponentially higher than the original lightning. However, this was mere conjecture, and Naruto had yet to even truly try it, much less master it. The abilities to absorb lightning and reflect it were all he needed for now. The brain communicates by very small neuroelectric shockwaves. Naruto had discovered that by planting his iron dust in certain areas of the part of the brain which creates the sensation of pain, he could manipulate these shockwaves to his will either shutting off pain completely, or, as was more useful here, elicit unimaginable amounts of pain in the victim without hurting them bodily in any way. Of course, this took incredible patience and precision, as planting them in the wrong place could cause loss of memory or nerve damage or death but, Unfortunately for this loyalist, if anyone was patient and precise, it was Naruto Hoshigaki Senju. The iron specks found their marks. I'll repeat. This pain will be absolutely unbearable and it will not end until you give me the information. 
There is no chance of you passing out or dying from this pain, so do not count on it. The only reason I keep asking you is that this technique requires my intense focus, which is something I abhor. This is your final chance. Fuck you. Very well. The general took the precaution of grabbing a couple of earplugs off the nearby table. Teton, twisted blessing. The screams made Naruto cringe not from the fact that the pain igniting them was inhumane, but their sheer volume. The Teton user wasn't just a dick he lacked the capacity to feel sympathy for his victim. He was a monster by birth, not choice. Within five seconds the centurion was crying out for it to end. She would tell everything she knew. For a while, all she could do was weep incessantly. Most likely she would be forever scarred by that experience fortunately enough, her forever was likely no more than ten minutes. After finally regaining her composure, he took Naruto's questions. On which island were you stationed? Senma. How many troops are stationed on that island? About 12,000. The mental state of the loyalist was such that if she was lying, even a novice would be able to tell, and Naruto was a seasoned expert. Will you really force me to use that technique again? The centurion visibly panicked. Okay. Okay. It's about 20,250. With the losses from this last battle, I'll say 20,000. The majority were probably from Anaka since they are the naval base, and it's better to overestimate anyway. If you lie again, I'll just use the technique without waiting for you to correct yourself. Describe the prison. The prison doubles as a farming work camp, since Senma is one of, if not the, largest source of food in the country. As such, the prisoners are usually outside in the fields. The ratio of prisoners to guards is roughly kept around 100 to 1. At the last count, there were 15,043 prisoners. They are kept under control by a seal which is a variation of a technique from Kusagakure. Any attempt at any kind of use of chakra results in a very painful burning sensation coursing throughout the prisoner's body. The warden, who is also the general of the island, is an A-rank shinobi going by the name Iso. He holds the seal key around his neck. Its destruction would result in all the seals being cancelled. Looks like an assassination mission. Fuck yes. What do you know of this general's abilities? I've never seen him fight, but there's a rumor that he is able to use four different chakra natures, all but Doden, and has very, very large chakra reserves. I don't know how much truth is in those rumors, though. Every rumor is rooted in some truth, the young man muttered to himself. Someone else will be coming in now to finish the interrogation, but I will be close by. If he is forced to bring me over here to persuade you, the next round of pain will be five minutes, not five seconds. Understand? Yes. Yes, absolutely. I'll do whatever you want, she said as tears began to form in her eyes again. Naruto, who had been exiting, suddenly stopped and cocked his head back toward her. Whatever I want. A chill ran through his body. He looked to the door of the interrogation room they were in. It was firmly locked, and if her earlier screams hadn't caused anyone even to knock, nothing would. The kunoichi before him was ridiculously hot, and her will too weak and her fear too great to try anything at all. It had been he that had captured her, so she was well aware that the interrogation jutsu wasn't his only trick. She had no chance, and no desire to try even if she did have one. The chills continued as he walked back toward her. When he was right in front of her, he unceremoniously dropped his pants, revealing his hard cock right in front of her face. The young lady's tears began falling even more quickly the moment this happened as it was obvious what he wanted and her creative imagination was formulating the most horrible things they could. Please don't, please, she pleaded. The boy's voice was much quieter and almost spastic in its consistency, as though he couldn't really control it. Shush shut the fuck up and SS suck my D dick. If you T try anything, I'll do that J jutsu until why you're a vegetable. The kunoichi almost let out a sigh of relief as this was a walk in the park compared to what he could have made her do. She realized that although he was a hardened killer, he was still just a boy wanting his first blowjob. This made it admittedly easier, being that it was a young man, and an attractive one at that, rather than a fat, ugly old man raping her in some incredibly painful and disgusting manner, which was the case far more often. However, this was still forced sex, and she felt sick, weak and taken advantage of. Without any further hesitation, he forced the all six and a half of his inches into her mouth with incoordinated haste, a perfectly fine length for what she guessed was a 16-year-old based on his build and the scruff on his face. 
He undid the cuffs holding her arms to the chair without even a thought of her trying something, his horniness, and perhaps a healthy dose of arrogance, getting to him, so that she could stroke his cock as she bobbed her head up and down on it with practiced elegance. She settled into a comfortable rhythm which pleased Naruto to no end. He had one hand on her head as she went back and forth of her own accord. She knew that he was nervous, so it may be a while before he finished, but she didn't want to be there forever. The kunoichi started to deep throat his cock as far as she could, her lips nearly reaching its base. She dropped her hands as there was now no space for them. The mixture of the feeling of the deep throating and, strangely enough, the sound, resulted in Naruto hitting his climax in seconds. He didn't scream or cry out, just let out some loud, guttural groans as rope after rope of his cum shot into the kunoichi's mouth. The young lady dutifully swallowed all of it without a request and began to get every last drop out by stroking his cock into her mouth in the same way that one squeezes the last bit of toothpaste out of a nearly empty container. As soon as she had finished, the young man pulled up his pants and cuffed her back to the chair. It was as though as soon as he came, he came back to his senses. He stormed out without a word or even a glance in her direction. You were in there for a while, Naruto Ippon. The head of the torture and interrogation division of the company said tonelessly. The Teton user tactfully evaded the question. She's extremely frightened. She'll answer any questions you have. The TNI leader went in without any further comments. Naruto was still catching his breath. Fuck, that was even more amazing than I thought it would be. I need Haku to do that for me. Haku, he felt a pang of something in his chest. What was this awful feeling? It wasn't pain but something deeper. Was this, guilt? No. Impossible he was incapable of feeling guilt. The fact that he hadn't even recognized it lent itself to that fact. But what else could it be? He shook his head and sped off to a different ship. It was time for his three-hour-long chakra control training. May had sent a team of three to Konoha to request aid in the war. The leader of the team, a janin by the name of Heiko, now addressed Minato and Jiraiya. We ask that you consider this not merely a moral issue of a group of people being systematically exterminated in a mass genocide, but also a potential political and military advantage for the state of Konohagakure. If you lend us significant aid in this war and we come out victorious, we will reward you with a treaty which is incredibly one-sided, especially by the standards of the present shinobi world we will be willing to fight by your side for the duration of any war in which you engage while you will be able to decide whether or not you would like to join any war in which we are engaged. Minato nodded, clearly impressed with the terms at hand. Jiraiya was pleased with them as well. These terms are very intriguing. The moral issue alone had me on the fence, but with this treaty in addition, I would be hard pressed not to accept your offer. I trust that the council will agree, the Yandaimi Hokage responded. To San? I absolutely agree. That kind of help from any one of the five great ninja villages would be indispensable, no matter what kind of state they're in. Arigato, Hokage-sama, Jiraiya-sama. Kiri will forever be in your debt. Minato smiled that beaming Senju smile. There is one caveat the entire western half of Mizu no Kuni is under loyalist control. Attempting to smuggle weapons, supplies, and troops through their blockades would be impossible. We cannot provide you with help until you take this island in the northwest, Hago. Ah, I see. I will inform Mei Shusho of this. Again, your thanks from Kiri. Farewell and may you have a swift victory in your upcoming war, Heiko finished. Seeing that there was nothing left to be said, he and his team shunshined away. Oh, yeah, Minato sighed. That. A couple weeks later, Third Company had established their first foothold on Senma Island Gashi a southern port town that in the past had been a quite wealthy city, but after years of neglect from the government it was soon reduced to a crime capital run entirely by gangs. These gangs, however, were quite rich, and more than willing, after a healthy dose of persuasion from the rebels, to share their food and weapons, with which they were replete, as well as allow them to make camp in their territory. Other than the very few patrol ships that were quickly dispatched, there had yet to be any real resistance to the invasion of the island from the loyalists, as though they had been expecting it and were biding their time, awaiting what they thought would be the perfect opportunity to strike. Knowing this, Jay made sure to waste no time in making moves of his own. He had summoned Naruto to the makeshift headquarters that had been set up in the center of Gashi. 
the loyalists have yet to attack us I'm of the opinion that they're waiting for us to launch a full-out assault on the prison to set off some sort of trap, or ambush us somehow. They know they have inferior numbers, and I have no reports as of yet of reinforcements coming from Anaka, so they are on their own, forcing them to get creative. Therefore, I have a very, very vital operation for you to perform to give us the leg up in the fight for this island. A mission that consists of the assassination of Iso and a rescue. Senma Prison, which houses about 15,000 rebels, is about 15 miles away from the fort that houses the troops stationed there far enough that it's not an eyesore and a temptation, but close enough that no reasonable person would attempt to sneak out the prisoners right under their noses. Too bad for the loyalists that war is not for the well reasoned. Wait. My mission is to assassinate Iso and escape the island with all those prisoners? In theory, it would be easier to just release them in the middle of battle, but most of these people haven't used chakra in years even with their seals off, it will take some time for them to readjust to using jutsu. On top of that, they'll be completely unarmed, which will only lead to a lot of lost new allies. Also, correction our mission. I'll be giving you a team. I don't work in teams. I'll be fine by myself. I don't recall asking for your opinion. I'm not your buddy asking you what you think. I'm your commanding officer telling you how things are going to be. Understood? Yes, sir. The head general sighed. He doesn't give a shit about anything, does he? With a wave of his hand, three men dressed in the standard clothing of Kiri Anbu, complete with face masks each representative of a different bird, appeared. Kiri's infiltration unit which consists of separate divisions for assassinations, reconnaissance and sabotage, along with our hunter ninja unit, has long been praised as the best in the elemental nations. Very fortunately for us, most of this unit ended up on the rebel side, mostly because of the unspeakable missions Yugura forcibly coerced them to perform by holding their families hostage. Even Anbu still have morals, after all. But enough rambling Naruto, meet Robin, Finch and Hawk. First and second company chose the grizzly, seasoned vets, but I've always put my stock in a high talent ceiling and youth. These three are the creme de la creme of young infiltration shinobi, which, if you were listening just now, is something of a big deal. They were so good, in fact, that they were placed outside the confines of the usual division and taught everything. As long as you're kicking, these three will be the ones by your side, always on discreet operations, but sometimes on the battlefield as well. I suggest you four get to know each other before this mission. I expect you back here at precisely 2,315 hours tonight. Understood? Four nods answered him, so he left to tend to other duties. His departure prompted a tense silence between Naruto and the three Anbu. Neither party moved an inch. Jay Ippen suggested we get to know each other, Robin finally stated dryly. Why do you bear animosity toward me? Surely you're not bitter about being captained by a 13 year old. Of course not, Finch answered. We have all been in your situation stronger than our elders, and therefore given the responsibility of leading them. Age and skill have no correlation in shinobi matters. A lack of trust, then. Indeed. Quite simply, we have no reason to trust you, and the years we spent in Anbu under Yugura have led us to believe that trust is hard won, and harder kept, Hawk explained. No reason? Isn't it quite clear that I'm devoted to this cause? From the outside, yes, it would seem that way for the most part. But I am an expert sensor, and your chakra well, quite frankly, it's disturbing. It has a coldness the depth of which I have never felt before, yet, underneath the surface, lies a hatred that burns so hot the sun itself would wither under its glare. We wonder what you are, Hawk answered, not once changing the direction of his gaze or the tone of his voice, just like the other two. There was silence for a moment. There is nobody else here, the young general finally said. Take off your masks. A man's face reveals more about him than any of his words. They were barely twenty, if that. They all had handsome faces under their short, dark hair, although scars jutted haphazardly between their attractive features. Naruto had been worried they were just green rookies who were way in over their heads, but these scars and the emptiness in their eyes made it clear that they had seen comrades die many times over some as a result of their own shortcomings. Let's not worry about my purpose for now. What are your ambitions? They are precisely as Jay Ippen said, but in addition to that, Hawk and I have a keke jenke. We truly love our people, and wish to see that tyrant overthrown as swiftly as possible so that Mei Shusho can lead this country down a more prosperous and righteous path, answered Robin. 
I see. I must admit, I do not bear the same admiration for my country that you three so nobly do, the young one admitted. Mine, however, is an ambition that will obliterate the entire loyalist army by itself if it must. I cannot force you to trust me, but know this I will do whatever it takes to win this war and kill Yugura with my own two hands, is that understood? Yes, Tycho, they chorused. One final question. How long have you three been serving together? Nearly seven years. Excellent. Let's discuss combat abilities. By 2355, Naruto's team was on the move. They had donned swimsuits complete with oxygen tanks to cover the distance from their ships to the island, which was nearly three miles. Chakra dashing would have alerted every sensor in the area of their location, and walking was too risky because of the fact that they had no cover to shield themselves from the patrol ships constantly surveying the area around the island. They made good time to the prison. For a normal chunin, it would have taken several hours, but for this team it took only two. To a normal chunin, the spot they stopped at were the ruins of some long forsaken hut. But to this team, it was an imposing concrete building of impressive size, old, worn and gray, with thousands of souls inside. Naruto gathered his new team. The second I kill Iso, you all know what to do. I can sense him very faintly to the northeast, so he should be out of the way enough to prevent our fight from setting off any alarms. I'll draw him away further just in case. Once I contact you that I've destroyed the seal, you all know what sectors are yours to clear. Wow. It just hit me how truly dangerous this mission is. The chance that an alarm goes off and the entire island comes down on our asses is immeasurably high. You three better be up to snuff if you expect to complete this mission successfully. Don't worry, we are. J. Ippen doesn't put his trust in just anyone, especially for missions of this magnitude. Naruto didn't answer, but shunshined away. The young Senju found himself at a relatively humble ranch house surrounded by a simple but excellently kept garden. The spring season had given way to Indian paintbrush, hydrangeas and sunflowers populating the fresh soil. The house was in the middle of an open field flanked two ways by forest, the other by a river and the last the way Naruto had come, which led to a developed road in the prison. As expected, due to the very late hour, no lights were on inside the house. The young man found it strange that a hardened, no doubt wholly evil loyalist a rank general shinobi would live in such a tame and familial establishment, but did not meditate on it for too long. He activated what was perhaps his favorite jutsu, wind embodiment jutsu. The transformation of one's body into the, or one of the, elements for which they have an affinity was always classified as a cage-level technique for that element, considered to require the greatest level of elemental manipulation. At this point, his wind manipulation was not quite at that level, powerful though it was, yet his affinity for managing to circumvent conventional knowledge was stronger than his affinity for any chakra nature. So learn the jutsu he did. He swept through the crack in the door and to what he assumed was the hallway which led to the bedroom. He slipped through the crack of a door at the end of the hall, and what he saw, the wind embodiment jutsu is known to allow the user sight somehow although the few who have ever been able to use it have been neither willing nor able to explain it, surprised him ever so slightly. Iso wasn't the only one here. There was a woman in bed with him, a child about two years old between them, and a crib with a child only a few months old inside. Naruto hadn't sensed them because they didn't have active chakra coils. The one thing he hadn't gotten down was killing people in that form, so he materialized by the bed on Iso's side, he formed an iron spike and prepared to slice the loyalist's jugular. His heart stopped when he felt a hand grab his wrist. Before he could move, a kanai was on his neck and he heard a whisper. I wouldn't move another inch if I were you. That's funny, Naruto answered with a smirk. If I were you, I'd do the exact opposite. The genjutsu had been impressive and thorough, at least. But these Senma islanders put far too much faith in their illusions. It's sad, really. Naruto had already made the call into his teammates to begin the second phase of the mission as he pondered his incredibly swift victory. I almost regret not being able to see if it was true that the guy had four elemental affinities. Then again, some a rank ninja that was, falling for an explosive clone. I swear, shinobi are so much fucking weaker in reality than their ranks make them seem. Then again, not all of them have a 150 plus IQ. But who's counting? The young man hurried back to the prison. By the time he got back, Hawk and Finch were outside the main door, standing idly and occasionally checking their watches. What are you two doing? 
Their captain said indignantly. You need to be in there doing shit. Robbins got it. We incapacitated all the guards already. He's sealing everyone into scrolls to make this transportation a lot easier. Okay. There is no scroll large enough to seal all those people into. Hawk sighed. He takes full advantage of the zero-sum law of sealing, that no matter how full a seal is, the space it takes up when sealed into another seal is the same as though it were empty. He seals 20 scrolls into one scroll, then 20 scrolls into each of those 20, and so on. Robin is constantly carrying tens of thousands of scrolls on his person, all in the space of a scroll small enough to carry inconspicuously on his person. So he's got more than enough to seal all those people. Naruto slowly nodded as he wondered why he had never thought of that himself. He also mentally sighed in relief. If he was being perfectly honest with himself, he knew that even he probably would not have been able to succeed in the mission. For all those people unused to using chakra, the trip might have taken upwards of a day. By then, they would have been swarmed by every loyalist on the island. And you too don't know how to seal humans? No, Taiko. Robin is the Fuinjutsu expert among us. He's got shadow clones helping him, so he shouldn't be too long. Sure enough, it was a matter of minutes before he came out, tucking away the scroll as he walked. The hardest part was convincing them that we are on their side, then that sealing them is completely safe. Suddenly the dark-haired captain cocked his head to the right, toward the direction of the house, from which he had just come. Hawk, do you? Yes, Tycho. This is troubling. What's wrong? Finch demanded. Some silent alarm must have gone off. Thousands of shinobi are headed this way from the northeast. Not just the northeast, Naruto corrected. They are coming from every direction. This trap was set quite a while ago. How can that be? Was there perhaps a barrier we missed? No, that's impossible. We would have sensed it. We can theorize later, but for now we need an escape route. I strongly disbelieve that even with all of our skills we can take on this many enemies. Perhaps any other group would have been scared nearly to death, but these four were calm as the breeze passing through the area. They silently considered various modes of extraction. I have a plan, Naruto said as he pulled out a scroll. Hurry, they're very close. Several legions of Kiri loyalists descended upon the prison. Upon the command of their officers, they began furiously searching the area nearby. Many minutes later, they reported the prison as empty, the trail of the prisoners being non-existent, and the trail of their shinobi escorts as going cold just outside the entrance. After a good bout of yelling from a few legionnaires, the group of thousands mutually decided to move their search elsewhere. One centurion, an expert censor, approached his legionnaire just before they all took off. Sir, I sense a chakra signature somewhere around here. It's sort of wispy and difficult to distinguish from just normal air but I do believe someone is somehow hiding themselves in the air. The legionnaire gave him a perplexed expression then burst into laughter. Don't be ridiculous, soldier, that's impossible. We've been ordered to search the southeast, so bring your century and follow me. The centurion sighed and reluctantly nodded. A few minutes later, the prison had been abandoned once again. Naruto materialized from the wind and pulled out a scroll. Upon making the appropriate hand sign, Three shinobi were unsealed from it and appeared before him. If I may say, that was an excellent plan, Tycho. And I don't give out compliments freely, Finch said. Let's idle around here no longer. We have allies to deliver. Taking Tantatsu Island had been a breeze for Second Company. The place was nothing but farms for miles, with around 7,500 soldiers stationed there, if that. It was definitely the most top heavy company Kisame. Itachi and Zabuza probably contributed a third of the casualties by themselves. The problem came with the next targets. Kanshi and Ranso. Kanshi was the largest prison in Mizu no Kuni. Ranso, apparently a navy and weapons depot and they just happened to be right next to each other, close enough to see one shore from the other. On top of that, Ranso was not much further from the southern city of Meizo, which no doubt had a significant number of troops itself. Fortunately, Intel in the form of a message from First Company had come through. Ranso had a relatively small number of troops, about 16,000, while Kashi had less than 2,000 because of its small size and proximity to the other island. These numbers seemed low, the message admitted, but that was because there was a reallocation of troops to Meizo after many of their troops were sent to the center of the mainland. The prison, meanwhile, held 20,000 troops. 
Itachi, as always, was very wary of the information. However, as he considered why he was, he realized it was nothing more than a gut feeling. No solid evidence supported this feeling, so he dismissed it as well as he could. Kisame, of course, was fully on board. This says that right now, the troops are still readjusting to their numbers and so are out of whack. I say we ready to launch an attack by tomorrow. I agree, Zabuza stated. If we can catch them off guard, this company will have even fewer issues dealing with them. With all those prisoners added to our forces, we can take Meizo within weeks. Itachi was about to input his own opinion, but quickly retracted it. Their reason was sound, and the rebels' plan had always been to end the war as quickly as possible to minimize casualties. This temporary shortage of troops might very well be the opportunity they were waiting for. Besides, they had spent enough time on that barren island. Kisami's legendary sword Samahata purred as it took the blood of yet another victim. The four-star general's grin widened as he saw how his company was dominating its foes. Just as the intel had said, the number of troops on these islands were far inferior to their own. That is, until Itachi Shunshine to him with very troubling news. The intel was inaccurate. Tens of thousands of troops swung around our flank while thousands more have emerged from underground this island. We are surrounded and outnumbered. What? God damn it, spread the news, we are on full retreat mode back to Tantatsu. I will hold off those troops as best I can. Use your head, Kisame. You can't possibly hold off over 40,000 loyalists all alone. The company will have to fight their way through. The Hoshigaki gazed back at all the rebel ships anchored by the island. Ranso was a small island, so they had surrounded it. He grimaced slightly as he realized that while they would come out of this missing a lot of ships, they would probably lose more than enough men to balance it out. He could already see the enemy navy closing in from the east, while more and more of their land troops approached on land from the west. It was a hell of a position to be in. Fair enough. Here's the plan. I take 10,000 and clear a path that way. You and Zabuza stay here and do what you can against these. Very well. Good luck, Kisame. I think you need it more. Don't use those eyes too much. No promises. By the time the loyalist ships were halting behind the rebels, Kisame had gathered his troops and launched the attack. Most soldiers had abandoned their ships and set to fighting on the ocean's surface. The numbers disadvantage was obvious from the start, but Kisame and his monstrous chakra were doing an excellent job of diminishing it until a man in gold armor jumped into his path. The shark man ran at him and tried to slice him like many of the rest, but this man deflected the strike with ease and tripped Kisame for good measure. After being sent skidding and getting up, he saw the man clearly. He was a bit taller than Itachi, but with a remarkably long wingspan. He sported the blue hair that was common in that country, but it was in a buzz cut instead of being spiked. Kisame Hoshigaki, he said venomously. Pleasure to be the last face your pathetic eyes see. What's up? Guy who isn't important enough for me to know and who will be dead in five minutes. The pleasure is all yours. Meanwhile, Itachi was dispatching centurion after centurion with Kaden Jutsu after Kaden Jutsu. He barreled his umpteenth fireball toward a group of loyalists when it was cut short by a large wall of water. The Akatsuki glanced over to see a man with golden armor and dark red hair which was tied in a ponytail, it reached between his shoulder blades. I see right through your Uchiha Genjutsu, it won't work on me, the man said. I know not to make eye contact with you. Good luck beating me now. Your eyes see nothing. Prepare to meet a swift demise. And so began the first battle for Ranso. A couple weeks later, Third Company had established their first foothold on Senma Island Gashi, a southern port town that in the past had been a quite wealthy city, but after years of neglect from the government it was soon reduced to a crime capital run entirely by gangs. These gangs, however, were quite rich, and more than willing, after a healthy dose of persuasion from the rebels, to share their food and weapons, with which they were replete, as well as allow them to make camp in their territory. Other than the very few patrol ships that were quickly dispatched, there had yet to be any real resistance to the invasion of the island from the loyalists, as though they had been expecting it and were biding their time, awaiting what they thought would be the perfect opportunity to strike. Knowing this, Jay made sure to waste no time in making moves of his own. He had summoned Naruto to the makeshift headquarters that had been set up in the center of Gashi. The loyalists have yet to attack us I'm of the opinion that they're waiting for us to launch a full-out assault on the prison to set off some sort of trap, or ambush us somehow. 
They know they have inferior numbers, and I have no reports as of yet of reinforcements coming from Anaka, so they are on their own, forcing them to get creative. Therefore, I have a very, very vital operation for you to perform to give us the leg up in the fight for this island. A mission that consists of the assassination of Iso and a rescue. Senma Prison, which houses about 15,000 rebels, is about 15 miles away from the fort that houses the troops stationed there far enough that it's not an eyesore and a temptation, but close enough that no reasonable person would attempt to sneak out the prisoners right under their noses. Too bad for the loyalists that war is not for the well reasoned. Wait. My mission is to assassinate Iso and escape the island with all those prisoners? In theory, it would be easier to just release them in the middle of battle, but most of these people haven't used chakra in years even with their seals off, it will take some time for them to readjust to using jutsu. On top of that, they'll be completely unarmed, which will only lead to a lot of lost new allies. Also, correction our mission. I'll be giving you a team. I don't work in teams. I'll be fine by myself. I don't recall asking for your opinion. I'm not your buddy asking you what you think. I'm your commanding officer telling you how things are going to be. Understood? Yes, sir. The head general sighed. He doesn't give a shit about anything, does he? With a wave of his hand, three men dressed in the standard clothing of Kiri Anbu, complete with face masks each representative of a different bird, appeared. Kiri's infiltration unit, which consists of separate divisions for assassinations, reconnaissance and sabotage, along with our hunter ninja unit has long been praised as the best in the elemental nations. Very fortunately for us, most of this unit ended up on the rebel side, mostly because of the unspeakable missions Yugura forcibly coerced them to perform by holding their families hostage. Even Anbu still have morals, after all. But enough rambling Naruto, meet Robin, Finch and Hawk. First and second company chose the grizzly, seasoned vets, but I've always put my stock in a high talent ceiling and youth. These three are the creme de la creme of young infiltration shinobi, which, if you were listening just now, is something of a big deal. They were so good, in fact, that they were placed outside the confines of the usual division and taught everything. As long as you're kicking, these three will be the ones by your side, always on discreet operations, but sometimes on the battlefield as well. I suggest you four get to know each other before this mission. I expect you back here at precisely 2,315 hours tonight understood? Four nods answered him, so he left to tend to other duties. His departure prompted a tense silence between Naruto and the three Anbu. Neither party moved an inch. Jay Ippon suggested we get to know each other, Robin finally stated dryly. Why do you bear animosity toward me? Surely you're not bitter about being captained by a thirteen-year-old? Of course not, Finch answered. We have all been in your situation stronger than our elders, and therefore given the responsibility of leading them. Age and skill have no correlation in shinobi matters. A lack of trust, then. Indeed. Quite simply, we have no reason to trust you, and the years we spent in Anbu under Yugura have led us to believe that trust is hard won, and harder kept, Hawk explained. No reason? Isn't it quite clear that I'm devoted to this cause? From the outside, Yes, it would seem that way for the most part. But I am an expert sensor, and your chakra well, quite frankly, it's disturbing. It has a coldness the depth of which I have never felt before, yet, underneath the surface, lies a hatred that burns so hot the sun itself would wither under its glare. We wonder what you are, Hawk answered, not once changing the direction of his gaze or the tone of his voice, just like the other two. There was silence for a moment. There is nobody else here, the young general finally said. Take off your masks. A man's face reveals more about him than any of his words. They were barely twenty, if that. They all had handsome faces under their short, dark hair, although scars jutted haphazardly between their attractive features. Naruto had been worried they were just green rookies who were way in over their heads, but these scars and the emptiness in their eyes made it clear that they had seen comrades die many times over some as a result of their own shortcomings. Let's not worry about my purpose for now. What are your ambitions? They are precisely as Jay Ippon said, but in addition to that, Hawk and I have a keke jenke. We truly love our people, and wish to see that tyrant overthrown as swiftly as possible so that Mei Shusho can lead this country down a more prosperous and righteous path, answered Robin. I see. I must admit, I do not bear the same admiration for my country that you three so nobly do, the young one admitted. Mine, 
however, is an ambition that will obliterate the entire loyalist army by itself if it must. I cannot force you to trust me, but know this I will do whatever it takes to win this war and kill Yugura with my own two hands, is that understood? Yes, Tycho, they chorused. One final question. How long have you three been serving together? Nearly seven years. Excellent. Let's discuss combat abilities. By 2355, Naruto's team was on the move. They had donned swimsuits complete with oxygen tanks to cover the distance from their ships to the island, which was nearly three miles. Chakra dashing would have alerted every sensor in the area of their location, and walking was too risky because of the fact that they had no cover to shield themselves from the patrol ships constantly surveying the area around the island. They made good time to the prison. For a normal chunin, it would have taken several hours, but for this team it took only two. To a normal chunin, the spot they stopped at were the ruins of some long forsaken hut. But to this team, it was an imposing concrete building of impressive size, old, worn and gray, with thousands of souls inside. Naruto gathered his new team. The second I kill Iso, you all know what to do. I can sense him very faintly to the northeast, so he should be out of the way enough to prevent our fight from setting off any alarms. I'll draw him away further just in case. Once I contact you that I've destroyed the seal, you all know what sectors are yours to clear. Wow. It just hit me how truly dangerous this mission is. The chance that an alarm goes off and the entire island comes down on our asses is immeasurably high. You three better be up to snuff if you expect to complete this mission successfully. Don't worry, we are. Jay Ippen doesn't put his trust in just anyone, especially for missions of this magnitude. Naruto didn't answer, but Shun shined away. The young Senju found himself at a relatively humble ranch house surrounded by a simple but excellently kept garden. The spring season had given way to Indian paintbrush, hydrangeas and sunflowers populating the fresh soil. The house was in the middle of an open field flanked two ways by forest, the other by a river and the last the way Naruto had come, which led to a developed road in the prison. As expected, due to the very late hour, no lights were on inside the house. The young man found it strange that a hardened, no doubt wholly evil loyalist a rank General Shinobi would live in such a tame and familial establishment, but did not meditate on it for too long. He activated what was perhaps his favorite jutsu, wind embodiment jutsu. The transformation of one's body into the, or one of the, elements for which they have an affinity was always classified as a cage-level technique for that element, considered to require the greatest level of elemental manipulation. At this point, his wind manipulation was not quite at that level, powerful though it was, yet his affinity for managing to circumvent conventional knowledge was stronger than his affinity for any chakra nature. So learn the jutsu he did. He swept through the crack in the door and to what he assumed was the hallway which led to the bedroom. He slipped through the crack of a door at the end of the hall, and what he saw, the wind embodiment jutsu is known to allow the user sight somehow although the few who have ever been able to use it have been neither willing nor able to explain it, surprised him ever so slightly. Iso wasn't the only one here. There was a woman in bed with him, a child about two years old between them, and a crib with a child only a few months old inside. Naruto hadn't sensed them because they didn't have active chakra coils. The one thing he hadn't gotten down was killing people in that form, so he materialized by the bed on Iso's side, he formed an iron spike and prepared to slice the loyalist's jugular. His heart stopped when he felt a hand grab his wrist. Before he could move, a kanai was on his neck and he heard a whisper. I wouldn't move another inch if I were you. That's funny, Naruto answered with a smirk. If I were you, I'd do the exact opposite. XB2 me QJ1 JJBJA6 CTH1 GYFDN ZDUS FRACTVGXXXX The Genjutsu had been impressive and thorough, at least. But these Senma Islanders put far too much faith in their illusions. It's sad, really. Naruto had already made the call into his teammates to begin the second phase of the mission as he pondered his incredibly swift victory. I almost regret not being able to see if it was true that the guy had four elemental affinities. Then again, some rank ninja that was, falling for an explosive clone. I swear, shinobi are so much fucking weaker in reality than their ranks make them seem. Then again, not all of them have a 150 plus IQ. But who's counting? The young man hurried back to the prison. By the time he got back, Hawk and Finch were outside the main door, 
standing idly and occasionally checking their watches. What are you two doing? Their captain said indignantly. You need to be in there doing shit. Robbins got it. We incapacitated all the guards already. He's sealing everyone into scrolls to make this transportation a lot easier. Okay. There is no scroll large enough to seal all those people into. Hawk sighed. He takes full advantage of the zero-sum law of sealing, that no matter how full a seal is, the space it takes up when sealed into another seal is the same as though it were empty. He seals 20 scrolls into one scroll, then 20 scrolls into each of those 20, and so on. Robin is constantly carrying tens of thousands of scrolls on his person, all in the space of a scroll small enough to carry inconspicuously on his person. So he's got more than enough to seal all those people. Naruto slowly nodded as he wondered why he had never thought of that himself. He also mentally sighed in relief. If he was being perfectly honest with himself, he knew that even he probably would not have been able to succeed in the mission. For all those people unused to using chakra, the trip might have taken upwards of a day. By then, they would have been swarmed by every loyalist on the island. And you too don't know how to seal humans? No, Taiko. Robin is the Fuinjutsu expert among us. He's got shadow clones helping him, so he shouldn't be too long. Sure enough, it was a matter of minutes before he came out, tucking away the scroll as he walked. The hardest part was convincing them that we are on their side, then that sealing them is completely safe. Suddenly the dark-haired captain cocked his head to the right, toward the direction of the house, from which he had just come. Hawk, do you? Yes, Tycho. This is troubling. What's wrong? Finch demanded. Some silent alarm must have gone off. Thousands of shinobi are headed this way from the northeast. Not just the northeast, Naruto corrected. They are coming from every direction. This trap was set quite a while ago. How can that be? Was there perhaps a barrier we missed? No, that's impossible. We would have sensed it. We can theorize later, but for now we need an escape route. I strongly disbelieve that even with all of our skills we can take on this many enemies. Perhaps any other group would have been scared nearly to death, but these four were calm as the breeze passing through the area. They silently considered various modes of extraction. I have a plan, Naruto said as he pulled out a scroll. Hurry, they're very close. Several legions of Kiri loyalists descended upon the prison. Upon the command of their officers, they began furiously searching the area nearby. Many minutes later, they reported the prison as empty, the trail of the prisoners being non existent and the trail of their shinobi escorts is going cold just outside the entrance. After a good bout of yelling from a few legionnaires, the group of thousands mutually decided to move their search elsewhere. One centurion, an expert censor, approached his legionnaire just before they all took off. Sir, I sense a chakra signature somewhere around here. It's sort of wispy and difficult to distinguish from just normal air, but I do believe someone is somehow hiding themselves in the air. The legionnaire gave him a perplexed expression then burst into laughter. Don't be ridiculous, soldier, that's impossible. We've been ordered to search the southeast, so bring your century and follow me. The centurion sighed and reluctantly nodded. A few minutes later, the prison had been abandoned once again. Naruto materialized from the wind and pulled out a scroll. Upon making the appropriate hand sign, three shinobi were unsealed from it and appeared before him. If I may say, that was an excellent plan, Tycho. And I don't give out compliments freely, Finch said. Let's idle around here no longer. We have allies to deliver. Taking Tantatsu Island had been a breeze for Second Company. The place was nothing but farms for miles, with around 7,500 soldiers stationed there, if that. It was definitely the most top heavy company Kisame, Itachi, and Zabuza probably contributed a third of the casualties by themselves. The problem came with the next targets, Kanshi and Ranso. Kanshi was the largest prison in Mizu no Kuni. Ranso, apparently a navy and weapons depot and they just happened to be right next to each other, close enough to see one shore from the other. On top of that, Ranso was not much further from the southern city of Meizo, which no doubt had a significant number of troops itself. Fortunately, intel in the form of a message from First Company had come through, Ranso had a relatively small number of troops, about 16,000, while Kashi had less than 2,000 because of its small size and proximity to the other island. These numbers seemed low, the message admitted, but that was because there was a reallocation of troops to Meizo after many of their troops were sent to the center of the mainland. 
the prison, meanwhile, held 20,000 troops. Itachi, as always, was very wary of the information. However, as he considered why he was, he realized it was nothing more than a gut feeling. No solid evidence supported this feeling, so he dismissed it as well as he could. Kisame, of course, was fully on board. This says that right now, the troops are still readjusting to their numbers and so are out of whack. I say we ready to launch an attack by tomorrow. I agree, Zabuza stated. If we can catch them off guard, this company will have even fewer issues dealing with them. With all those prisoners added to our forces, we can take Meizo within weeks. Itachi was about to input his own opinion, but quickly retracted it. Their reason was sound, and the rebels' plan had always been to end the war as quickly as possible to minimize casualties. This temporary shortage of troops might very well be the opportunity they were waiting for. Besides, they had spent enough time on that barren island. Kisami's legendary sword Samahata purred as it took the blood of yet another victim. The four-star general's grin widened as he saw how his company was dominating its foes. Just as the intel had said, the number of troops on these islands were far inferior to their own. That is, until Itachi shunshined to him with very troubling news. The intel was inaccurate. Tens of thousands of troops swung around our flank while thousands more have emerged from underground this island. We are surrounded and outnumbered. What? God damn it! Spread the news, we are on full retreat mode back to Tantatsu. I will hold off those troops as best I can. Use your head, Kisame. You can't possibly hold off over 40,000 loyalists all alone. The company will have to fight their way through. The Hoshigaki gazed back at all the rebel ships anchored by the island. Ranso was a small island, so they had surrounded it. He grimaced slightly as he realized that while they would come out of this missing a lot of ships, they would probably lose more than enough men to balance it out. He could already see the enemy navy closing in from the east, while more and more of their land troops approached on land from the west. It was a hell of a position to be in. Fair enough. Here's the plan. I take 10,000 and clear a path that way. You and Zabuza stay here and do what you can against these. Very well. Good luck, Kisame. I think you need it more. Don't use those eyes too much. No promises. By the time the loyalist ships were halting behind the rebels, Kisame had gathered his troops and launched the attack. Most soldiers had abandoned their ships and set to fighting on the ocean's surface. The numbers disadvantage was obvious from the start, but Kisame and his monstrous chakra were doing an excellent job of diminishing it until a man in gold armor jumped into his path. The shark man ran at him and tried to slice him like many of the rest, but this man deflected the strike with ease and tripped Kisame for good measure. After being sent skidding and getting up, he saw the man clearly. He was a bit taller than Itachi, but with a remarkably long wingspan. He sported the blue hair that was common in that country, but it was in a buzz cut instead of being spiked. Kisame Hoshigaki, he said venomously. Pleasure to be the last face your pathetic eyes see. What's up? Guy who isn't important enough for me to know and who will be dead in five minutes. The pleasure is all yours. Meanwhile, Itachi was dispatching centurion after centurion with Kaiden Jutsu after Kaiden Jutsu. He barreled his umpteenth fireball toward a group of loyalists when it was cut short by a large wall of water. The Akatsuki glanced over to see a man with golden armor and dark red hair which was tied in a ponytail, it reached between his shoulder blades. I see right through your Uchiha Genjutsu, it won't work on me, the man said. I know not to make eye contact with you. Good luck beating me now. Your eyes see nothing. Prepare to meet a swift demise. And so began the first battle for Ranso. Kisame had gathered only Zabuza and Itachi in his war room, really a hastily set up tent. Immediately after the retreat had been completed and all had become relatively calm, soldiers had to set up their tents again in utter shame between tears for their fallen comrades they had packed all their belongings, expecting only to have to return to move their things to the next island, Ranso. The Hoshigaki hurriedly closed the flap of the tent tightly and used a jutsu to prevent any sound from escaping. Okay, there's a fucking mole and we have to find that person right fucking now, he whispered, despite the sound seals. You're way overreacting, Zabuza said at perfectly normal conversational volume, which slightly irked his comrade. Inaccurate information comes through all the time, it's an inevitable aspect of war. We just got very unlucky, he finished despondently. Just then, a lieutenant, presumably Hai Chunin, 
whose eyes were red from all the tears he'd recently shed, pushed open the tent flap despite the man trying his very hardest to hold him back. Fuck why let go of me, Ukaru. It's all because of you generals and your stupid greed and idiotic strategy that my wife died out there. My fucking wife. So Ukaru I swear to Kami. So go fuck yourselves you trash. I mean who the fuck does a frontal assault on an island like that? Don't you know anything? Kisame stalked over in rage to deal with him. You know what, you disrespectful. Wait. Kisame, Itachi interrupted. The one named Ukaru jumped in front of his mourning friend before the Uchiha could finish. Please forgive him, he pleaded, bowing low to his superiors. He truly wants nothing more than to win this war and he's normally very respectful. It's just that he really, really loved his wife and he's always been an easily moved person. The three leaders of the company ignored him. What is your name, soldier? Zabuza said, addressing the insolent one. Uh, um, I it's Rega, he muttered as he realized his terrible mistake and brushed aside his thick, light green hair. What would you have done in this situation, assuming you knew already that we would be heavily outnumbered, Itachi continued in his typical monotone. Oh, uh, well, okay, he stuttered as he led the four of them, including Ukaru, to a map of Mizu no Kuni on the wall. So here's Ranso and Kanchi, in the south, right? And there, right above them, on the mainland, is Meizo, a major port city. So what I would have done is, um, I guess, cause a commotion in Meizo, drawing all their numbers over there, then cut their ships off from returning with some sort of large-scale doten or sweeten jutsu. In that window we'd release the prisoners, destroy their weapons factory, take all the ships we can and destroy the rest, and get out before the bulk of their forces are back from Meizo. It's simple, but I think it could work. Problems. Meizo has forces of its own, so reinforcements from Ranso would most likely be minimal and we'd still be vastly outnumbered. Extraction for one of us three, who are the only ones who could cause a significant enough amount of chaos in that city, would be next to impossible. Finally, next time you decide to make a scene just so you can share a thoroughly flawed plan, don't, Itachi said. I was almost hopeful for a second. You mean you made up that story about your wife just so you could get in here and tell us your stupid plan? Fucking pathetic, Kisame muttered. See, Ukaru began, I told you they weren't stupid. Just lacking a good strategist. Rega chuckled as his friend produced a map of their own from a pouch he carried. All right, fair enough. You three, come here. Kisame and Zabuza were well beyond the threshold of confusion. Even Itachi was wondering who the hell goes to so much trouble for the sole purpose of sharing a strategy, but the fact that he was now ordering them around was decidedly perturbing. The map Ukaru had taken out was laid on top of the last one. It was of Mizu no Kuni, just like the other, but was coated with arrows and symbols that bordered on indecipherable. Okay, that was a fake plan to see if you three are totally useless or not we're relieved that you at least have an idea of what constitutes a decent strategy and what doesn't, Ukaru explained. Here comes the real one. Listen closely. Between Ranso, Kanshi, Meizo, and Chazu, which is right behind those three, Rega continued, there's upwards of 100,000 loyalist troops in our direct path. I believe the scientific term for that is a fuckload. There's absolutely no way we'll be able to defeat them with under 30,000. If we're to believe Sun Tzu, which I certainly do, you should only attack a fortified position if it is absolutely necessary, and then only if you have three times as many men as the other side. They have more than three times as many men as we do, which puts us in quite a predicament. Quite frankly, there are no diversionary tactics in existence which will win us a battle with that many enemy soldiers. We're screwed until First Company finishes their northern campaign. Well then, what the fuck was the point, wait. He never said we couldn't do anything in the meantime, said Ukaru. We are going to be here on Tantatsu for a very, very long time, most likely. What we need to do in the meantime is build incredibly strong fortifications to dissuade them from attacking us. Obviously they'd never come at us with all 100,000 or even 60,000, but better safe than sorry. Then we can employ the three S's, spying, sabotage and subterfuge. By the time First Company arrives, we can have them hungry, frustrated and confused to a very high degree, if you three will only listen to what Rega and I have to say. Let's be honest the southern campaign of Second Company is the most important of the war, probably the biggest step to victory, but our numbers are limited. 
We can't afford to have another huge fuck up like that slaughter we just came out of. So, what do you think? Silence pervaded the room. Finally the general of the company spoke. I'm willing to listen to what you have to say, the shark man allowed, but if you ever disrespect me again, I'll feed your worthless corpses to my sharks. Fair enough? The two new advisors gulped. Yes sir. The recon team just returned from searching the area, and things aren't looking good, Jay began. The Senma forces are fully aware of how outnumbered they are and how dire the situation is, so they've holed up in a city in the west with a civilian population of about 35,000, the largest on this island. They know that we won't leave the village without eliminating them all, so they've dropped all their military garb and weapons and exchanged them for civilian clothes. Without a censor, it's completely impossible to distinguish the roughly 20,000 loyalist ninja from the civilians, especially since the people are going along with it so flawlessly. What a cowardly fucking move, Finch spat. Jay, Naruto, and his team stood in one of the rooms of a motel in the town of Gashi, converted into the hub of operations for Third Company. It may be cowardly, but it was also extremely intelligent. I can't think of any strategy that will both keep the citizens unharmed and not take months to complete. We need to move as soon as possible First Company has been at Atari for far too long. So I gathered you all here in the hopes that you may have some way to do this. I've been working on something, Naruto volunteered, that could make this quite a simple matter. Go on. Well, I use working on, loosely it's really more of a theory. Sealing ninjutsu chakra into seals is a very possible, albeit advanced form of fuinjutsu, so why not? Genjutsu chakra, Robin finished, realization striking him suddenly. If we could seal a genjutsu into hundreds of large-scale tags and place them discreetly throughout the city, we could separate our enemies from the civilians and make them easy targets to boot by keying the seals to have different effects on those who have active chakra and those who don't. How feasible is this? Hawk asked, his interest peaked significantly. Theoretically, all it would take is ridiculously good chakra control, Robin answered as Naruto grinned. Which is exactly what both of us have. The city was bubbling with movement and excitement. Children played in the street while their parents shopped without a hint of frugality at the outdoor markets. The sun shone powerfully upon the place, casting its light upon the ornate brick highway and the laughing stream which ran alongside it. Summer weighed heavily upon Mizu, as far south as the country was, but this northern region did not feel it nearly so harshly. A pleasant breeze carrying the scents of fresh bread and sweet candies wafted past the noses of Naruto and Finch, who were under highly advanced henges completed with cover from a complex area genjutsu. It did not make them invisible, but they would fade into the background, wallflowers which no one would actively notice, as though they had been invisible all along. The surrounding civilians were either blissfully unaware of the war immediately around them or incredibly good actors, trying their damnedest to shield the grief and fear they felt at having to put themselves and their children in danger to quarter their soldiers. Over a third of the people they were looking at were soldiers and it showed. As the report had stated, none of them were wearing the clothes of a soldier, but that wasn't the only sign of a shinobi. They weren't even attempting to disguise their scars, their distrusting expressions, or their chakra, as Naruto could attest. This was an extremely dangerous mission. Even though they were protected by henges and genjutsu and they were suppressing their chakra as much as humanly possible, a skilled sensor who was truly paying attention would be able to spot them. But this was their greatest advantage none of their enemies knew that they had anything to look for. However, they were split up into pairs, as Naruto and Robin were the only ones who knew genjutsu advanced enough to hide them effectively, but they wanted to cover as much ground as possible. The onyx-haired younger man discreetly slid yet another tic-tac-sized seal tag underneath an empty stall by which they passed. This, the miniature seal, was something of Naruto's creation. This tag was not only much smaller, but held more chakra than a typical tag and had an automatic camouflage component, making it invisible to all but sensors and those with dujutsu. He and Finch strolled through the masses of people, clearly in no rush. Suddenly the latter heard his captain's voice in his mind it paled in comparison to what the Yamanaka clan of Konoha could do, but this was a very useful genjutsu, especially in situations precisely such as this. We are being followed. Do not look around. Just continue walking by me and do nothing. They were two chunin level ninja. Presumably one was a censor. That neither of them had gone off to gather reinforcements was surprising but welcome. 
they were either incredibly arrogant or not certain enough of a real threat to bother disturbing the peace by calling in more help. The captain sat down on a bench nearby and his subordinate followed. He sensed the two of them walking by, then turning around and walking past again, then turning around yet again, and so on and so forth for several minutes. Naruto had to let out a scoff at how poor their spying skills were. Unfortunately, he couldn't just kill them even if he used tiny specks of his iron to make it impossible to tell who had done it. Two chunin dying in the middle of the street would attract a bit more attention than was preferable. So another genjutsu it would be. He waited for them to circle back around and made eye contact with one, then channeled chakra to his ears and focused in on their conversation to ensure it had succeeded. Is a waste of time, like I said. We look like idiots just walking back and forth in front of them like this. Look at what they're wearing clearly just normal tourists looking to buy something. Then how do you explain the genjutsu? How sure are you that there was one at all? Well, I mean, pretty sure. You suck with genjutsu, Isabi. Let's just go, we're wasting our time. Naruto and Finch patiently watched them go and resumed their route, making sure to reinforce the genjutsu. Despite the large range of the seals, it took several hours to plant thousands of tags throughout the city between the four of them. However, the rest of the mission went without incident, as both the captain and Robin had to use their genjutsu expertise to get out of several tight spots but were successful nonetheless, and met the rest of the team back at headquarters. I hope you four didn't use too much chakra, because we're going in tonight, Jay said. The troops are all prepped and raring to go. They know the plan. Wait until the genjutsu takes effect and drives all the civilians to the eastern side of town, head to the northwestern district arena, where all the soldiers will be piled up, our Doden users will bring the place down on their heads and we make it rain kanai on whomever is still breathing. You have two hours before we head out. Outside the boundaries of that western city was all of third company, itching with excitement. The moon shone fully on that night, which promised to be a bloody one. The only source of light other than that eerie glow from the sky were fireflies, thousands of them, dancing about the forest in which the soldiers awaited the command to launch their assault. Privates and captains and sergeants alike checked their weapons one last time, affecting a symphony of metal scratching metal in a forest otherwise silent as the grave. The lieutenant general and his lover shared one last passionate kiss under the starlight. Please be safe, Haku pleaded, her eyes echoing the message. You don't have to worry about me, he said back quietly as he tucked her hair behind her ear. You just worry about taking care of yourself. I have to go now. Bye, Haku Chan. He kissed her cheek and ran off without waiting for a response. She held her hand against her cheek where he had kissed her, as though it would escape if she didn't. Goodbye, Naruto kun, she whispered, but only the wind was around to acknowledge it. She was alone again. I love you. Naruto and his team sped toward their destination with the practiced, utter silence of Anbu level shinobi. They didn't share a word. Their minds were fully in mission mode. Empty, totally empty, relying fully on instinct, the parameters of the mission submerged into their subconscious. In minutes they reached a conveniently located hill which overlooked the entire town. It was evening the market was still buzzing as streetlights lit. The captain sought confirmation from his superior, and once Jay gave the order, he nodded to Robin. In flawless sync, they performed the ram seal. The disturbance in chakra was so large it was, in a strange way, visible to the four of them, as though the physical realm were bending into waves for a brief second. Without hesitation, a majority of those in the market and a sizable number who had been in their homes sauntered off to the eastern side of town in unison. Meanwhile, a large minority performed the same zombie-like walk in the direction of the city's arena purportedly the largest on the island, easily large enough to hold that number of 20,000. It took everything the two of them had to focus on their objectives. It took razor-sharp concentration and precision to perform this correctly one slip from exhaustion and the entire illusion would fall apart. All the seals could do was augment the range of the original illusion Naruto and Robin still had to direct it. The former handled the shinobi, the latter the civilians. Finch and Hawk chipped in their own chakra. The two most likely could have completed the jutsu without the help, but this way they would not end up nearly so tired afterward as they would have been otherwise. After no small amount of sweat and heavy breathing, both targets had reached their respective destinations the seals would hold them there until the fight was over. Naruto put in the call to Jay, who in turn signaled to his troops that they were to follow him to the arena. 
Normally, a unanimous war cry would have shaken the air, but sound had to be kept to a minimum as any overt outside variables might disrupt the genjutsu. The four-man team that orchestrated it all jumped down and headed for the town. This is eerie as hell. Finch felt the need to comment as they raced through the empty, silent streets. The rest of the team nodded in agreement having been here just hours earlier, seeing it as a barren wasteland was stunning. A feeling swept through Naruto if anything were ever going to go wrong, it would go wrong now. It sent a chill through him. He desperately, desperately hoped everything would fall into place as it should. As the two groups neared the arena, he could clearly see cockiness oozing off the main force. After all, they must have been thinking, Naruto Ippon had taken care of it, so what could possibly go wrong? A detachment of only 5,000 had been sent for this mission, 200 of which were the best Doden users, as bringing the entire company to flood the town would have been cumbersome and was deemed unnecessary. The 200 hurried into the arena through the normal entrance accompanied by Jay while Naruto took his team to stand on the ring that formed the lip of the structure. The sun had long since set, making it nearly impossible to make out the forms of the tens of thousands standing in the field in lower rows, but they were surely there, standing perfectly still, in a mental world of their own. The Doden experts wasted no time in gathering in the lower levels and awaiting Jay's signals. They were still very far down it was a massive stadium, built to hold above a hundred thousand people, which was perplexing considering that number proportionate to the population. In any case, they were without yelling distance which made Naruto extremely worried as his senses picked up something exceedingly troubling. Hawk, do you, fucking hell, I do. Shit, they're too far for a shunshin. He jumped down to run toward them, but by then Jay had given the signal. The ground fell out from underneath the targets and more rock rose up to pancake them. 20,000 people dead in the blink of an eye. 20,000 helpless civilians killed at the hands of the rebel forces. What's up? Finch asked casually, not noticing the horrified look distorting his comrade's face. They must have used some kind of fuinjutsu to form artificial active chakra pathways on those people, he breathed out, almost in a whisper, the type of thing you can't notice unless you look for it. Those weren't shinobi, they were normal village people. We just killed 20,000, normal people. A similar look of horror struck the other two members of Naruto's team. Finch fell to his knees and struck the ground while Robin gathered himself and ran off to inform Jay. Meanwhile, the captain himself was about to return to his team when he noticed an unnatural light from the corner of his eye. He ran along the rows of seats to a cubic depression in the side of a wall. It was an automated camera equipped with night vision, and it was recording. He looked at the screen behind the lens to see that it read, Live, a note was stuck to the side of the machine. Now the whole country will see the true nature of you rebel scum. With love, ISO. The Teton user cursed himself and destroyed the camera. They must have detected the seals and figured out how to counter the genjutsu, but how? He had been so sure of himself, and now public opinion would turn overwhelmingly against the rebellion Konoha might even decide not to lend their aid anymore but he wasted no more time waiting in regret. It was very likely that a large-scale ambush was forthcoming, and if the note was true to its word then. Several explosions rang out outside the arena. Damn it, they're already here, and were bound to be ridiculously outnumbered. Naruto was thoroughly pissed off, which was about as common an occurrence as him losing a fight, but he had been outfoxed, outsmarted, and he hated absolutely nothing more than being outsmarted. He slammed his hand on the ground after running through some hand signs, a black web of seals sprawling out below. I hope this is a legitimate battle, the fiery bird boomed. Yeah, no more training, this is the real thing. Haven't quite had occasion to call you before, but now I really need your help, Tengoku. He pointed to the phoenix's back and gave a questioning look, which it returned with a sigh, or as close to a sigh as a legendary beast can produce. Yes. While I do not appreciate being ridden like some colt, my fire will not harm you. Thus relieved of his apprehensions, he wasted no time in hopping on. It hurriedly rose up over the lip of the arena, showing Naruto the chaotic scene unfolding just outside. The rebel forces were already in full retreat. The numbers were far, far in the enemy's favor, outnumbering them more than four to one. Jay did what he could to help with the retreat, raising a mountain of ice between his men and the other side but it didn't hold for long enough. Naruto directed his summon to hover between the two armies and they aimed their own jutsu at the enemy. Blistering whirlwind. 
A small tornado was lit aflame and it decimated the densely packed, unsuspecting loyalists, causing horrible shrieks to poison the night air that had already been filled with the perturbing sounds of war. Three black-clad figures descended to Naruto's side. What are you three doing here? Go help those retreating. His tone brooked no argument. No can do, Tycho, Finch asserted. We all know what you plan to do, but you can't take all of these guys on by yourself. I'm just tired of being on this god-forsaken island. If you three insist on staying, we can use the narrow streets to our advantage. Other than that, same plan as always. Now go. He yelled finally, just in time for the bird to elevate above a large sweet jutsu, and they scattered obediently. Content yourself with wreaking havoc, Tengoku, Naruto called as they flew above the enemy lines and his team set to work. I feel I'll be of more use on the ground. With that, he formed a few hand signs and preceded his fall with small grenade-like balls of lightning which exploded upon impact with the ground. Landing in the small clearing it formed, he was soon surrounded on all sides by enemies, none wanting to make the first move. If you insist on not making the first move, I certainly can. Iron spikes jutted out of the ground around him, instantaneously impaling dozens of people while the rest managed to jump out of the way. They all wasted no time in launching every jutsu they had at him, a menagerie of Sweden with the occasional katan and futon. As they rained down on him, he simply looked up at them calmly, admiring for a brief second their violent beauty. Then he was gone, in a flash. Where'd he g? A man called out, rudely interrupted by a lightning-enhanced Kurokage piercing his head. Before anyone around him could react, a burst of electricity shot out from their target and fried their circulatory systems. Naruto paused momentarily to allow the soldiers to get a good look at him, and was unsurprised by their panic gasps. It's, it's a lightning cloak. But how? Only the Sandame and Yandaimi Rakage have ever been able to do that. The Teton user smirked as bouts of electricity danced and crackled all around him, the static causing his hair to stand straight up and his cloak to be in constant motion. Cries rang out, testifying to Tengoku's and his teammates' work. Aren't the possibilities phenomenal when you have such a total mastery of chakra control? Just a hair too much Raiden chakra coursing through my body would kill me, but it feels so good to stand constantly right on the threshold of death. It's exhilarating. The loyalists around him were now thoroughly horrified, the ones nearest him unconsciously backing away. Naruto grinned an awful grin at one of them, too late. Meanwhile, the other three members of his little team were elsewhere working together to eliminate the enemies in the most efficient way possible, drawing them into narrow streets, nullifying their numbers' advantage. They were all very sure that if this were an open field and not a narrow residential district, they would not stand a chance against so many. Their captain preferred to fight solo, but they had always been best as a team. They needed to buy more time for their plan to succeed, so they found a narrow pass with a wall which they could back up against. Robin immediately formed an illusion which made the walls seem much, much higher than they really were, to discourage the enemy from simply climbing the rooftops to surround them, knowing that they would be too focused on the exciting adrenaline rush of battle to pick up the incredibly subtle signs of a masterful genjutsu. They only needed a few minutes. So the three of them set to forging a path paved with blood. Finch, the heavy hitter, launched the inaugural jutsu, Katen, Fierce Glory. He blew multiple small but extremely dense balls of fire randomly above the enemy forces and watched them hover, then, a brief second later, crash down in huge explosions, unhindered by the few weak protective Sweden that were thrown up. Hawk followed this up by charging his katana with lightning chakra and getting into the thick of it with his close-range expertise. Robin followed close behind, and was just in time as a rocket of water came dangerously close to striking his comrade and he jumped in front of it with a hand outstretched. Mighton, tenfold rebound. Every drop of the water was swallowed up in a black hole shaped like a saucer, then, as the name suggested, rebounded at the large group of loyalists standing right in front of him with ten times the power. Wasting no time, five of them charged Robin with Kanai, but he quickly deployed a genjutsu which knocked them all out immediately, so that the ones who had jumped ended up as unconscious bodies flying through the air. Robin, how much longer? Hawk called jumping away to gain some breathing room. Just a few more minutes, came the answer with a little less certainty than could school his comrades' discomfort. Plenty of time for us to die, 
Finch muttered as he used yet another futon wave to halt yet another hail of Kanai from the soldiers who were too threatened to simply charge him. In that case, six. Yeah, six, they answered over the fray and jumped back to be even with their companion. Hawk immediately began forming hand signs and finished them in the blink of an eye. Doton. Grand shift. First, short, jagged spikes erupted from the surface of the ground in the narrow street, tripping up the thousands of loyalists attacking them. Then, before they could even fully hit the ground, it lowered dozens of feet, trapping them in a box hundreds of feet long but only about twelve wide. By then, Finch and Robin had already risen up and formed their own jutsu, inspired wave. The latter's mouth let out a large current of water, while the other sent a shockwave of Raiden through it. Hundreds of the enemy found themselves helpless victims of the simple yet startlingly effective collaboration but it wasn't yet over. Finch immediately formed two shadow clones. Sage's Hydra. Five dragons of each element formed, Hawk providing Doton, Robin Sweden, and Finch and his clones the other three, and combined to form one black, multi-headed beast, which proceeded to roar as though it had a mind of its own then charged the trapped shinobi who had not been eliminated by the original attack. Although it didn't quite show on their faces, the three of them were pleased with the resulting bodies piling up. Robin cocked his head to the side. It's done, just in time too. I have just enough chakra. This was the first time Naruto had had the opportunity to use his lightning cloak in pitched battle, and he was having fun. He was far, far too fast for any of the loyalists to dream of touching him. Any thrown weapons were hundreds of times more likely to injure a comrade than him, the same going for swords and other close-range weapons. He was unstoppable, invincible. That is, until a massive bolt of lightning cut his enjoyment short. He was sent flying back out of the large crowd of loyalists, the Raiden strike outdoing his own protection of the same affinity. He noted the indiscrimination of the Jutsu's user, as he had killed several of his own men simply to land an ultimately inconsequential hit on his foe. The lieutenant general scoffed when his opponent came into view with a grandiose gesture of riding on a wave over his men, his blonde hair hanging in bangs over his forehead. His armor was a hot pink rather than the usual gold for an island's general this must be Iso. Quite the character. I suppose he thinks he's cool because he wears naturally effeminate colors, makes over the top entrances and kills his companions without a care. Not only is he an insecure wannabe, but he entrusted the key to the Senma prison to a decoy body double. A poser and a coward. He will die a slow death. Why, you're just a kid. And to think, you've been tossing these men around like trash, useless, he spat and cleanly separated a nearby centurion's head from his body with a keen futon jutsu, seemingly just to prove a point or to assert the dominance that he was doubtful he truly had. Alright, so that's three out of four, if the rumors are correct. Now all that's left is. Cat, Naruto decided not to stick around for the end of that one and recharged his lightning cloak, appearing in front of Iso in the blink of an eye. To the younger man's shock and dismay, the older one easily sidestepped the punch and simply tapped him in a carefully chosen spot on his ribcage, causing him to howl in pain as he flew by into the still present crowd of enemies. He was able to regain his balance in midair and land safely on his feet, making a quick check on what damage had been done. He must have been aiming to puncture my lung, but I was moving quickly enough that he missed. I'm going to have to be very careful meeting this guy close range. Hundreds of iron shuriken formed from all over his body and shot out at the enemies slowly creeping toward him to fend them off while his primary target yelled, you're the first person I've ever met could move fast enough to make me miss like that. And you're just a kid. You might have been something one of these days. Raiden. Emancipation. A tsunami of lightning rose up from in front of him and decimated every single soldier between the two of them, I saw not giving a care in the world that he had just killed 200 of his unsuspecting underlings in one blow. Teton. Center of mass jutsu. A highly dense ball of iron flew out to meet the massive wave of lightning and absorbed it whole, then dropped to the ground harmlessly, impressing Iso ever so slightly and resulting in the loyalist general noting that Raiden jutsu were useless against this enemy. He clearly does not care at all about killing his own men, for whatever reason that may be. If I play this correctly, I can get him to get rid of all his own men without me using a lot of my chakra. He looked analytically around at the enemies coming at him as Shirokage decapitated another soldier. And these loyalist fools don't know the meaning of the word, retreat. Caden. Pyre's tears. 
Naruto jumped out of the fireball's range, and a simple Sweden Jutsu was enough to defend himself from the spread damage. Dozens of loyalists suffered a very different fate. He smiled, finding this might be the easiest battle he would ever fight. Robin led the chase, his two teammates not far behind, with the thousands even after the previous collaboration Jutsu a good distance behind. Seemingly at random, Hawk made the hand signs to form an immense wall of earth between them which slowed even the fastest of the enemies for a full minute. But the added distance quickly evaporated, and the three of them were forced by fatigue and the gigantic numbers disadvantage into the largest section of the market district, structured in a gargantuan circle which comfortably fit the thousands who piled in without a care, all shamelessly seeking the glory and acknowledgement which would inevitably come with defeating such powerful foes. So there they were. Finch, Robin, and Hawk, backs against each other as they faced out in utter defiance against the hungry eyes and sharp taunts of their enemies. Then, with sarcastic waves and smiles, they disappeared in puffs of smoke. Panic flooded the crowd with impressive immediacy, then intensified greatly as a purple barrier rose up around them. Robin was focusing all his chakra into the manifestation of this massive seal. Fuin. Acidic air barrier, he coughed out. It took a fraction of a second to complete, far too quickly for any of the loyalists trapped inside to escape, and the Fuinjutsu expert collapsed the second it was done, overcome with chakra exhaustion. Before long, the poisonous oxygen inside was melting the skin off the encased enemies, a horrible sight none of the three wanted to see, so they turned around to go aid their captain. Hell of a plan, Robin, Finch said. First you had to find the place, then you had to have shadow clones make the barrier seal. Then you had to switch out your shadow clones and put them in the perfect place while we ran, then you had to. He gets it, Hawk said with a chuckle as he carried his comrade slung over his shoulder like a fireman, he gets it. We've all had our moments, Robin said with a tired look on his face as they maneuvered the rooftops toward the sound of explosions by the arena. Let's just hope Tycho hasn't gotten himself killed trying to get his. Tangoku was having his way with the loyalists, hovering well out of their range simply coughing out fireball after fireball to quench them in white flames hotter than any star. His concentrically ringed, metallic, purple eyes darted toward his owner with regularity to ensure he hadn't died of the constant a rank ninjutsu his enemy was using without reservation. He was ever so slightly impressed by how large the chakra reserves of this ISO were, as they'd been going for quite a while and he had yet to slow down then again. This was heavily outweighed by the fact that what had once been a company of at least 15,000 troops by that arena was now dwindling into the low 2000s. Of course, no small part of these casualties had been caused by Naruto and Tengoku themselves, but a startling number if they were being honest with themselves, the majority were a result of the carelessness of the loyalists' own pink-clad general. But the Teton user found himself in an increasingly tight spot. With fewer enemies came fewer hiding spots and distractions by now it was really just a bother that these couple thousand were around. The hope that Iso would use up all his chakra on this rampage was long gone by now. The man had seemingly infinite reserves. Naruto himself wasn't short on chakra, by any stretch of the imagination, but it was clear to him that he would not outlast Iso if it came down to it. Never one to seek aid, he secretly hoped his team would come back soon. The ever-present pests finally overwhelmed his patience he wanted it to be just him and Iso, a completely even fight. There were finally few enough that he could use a simple yet effective jutsu to end this bout. He formed the hand signs as he jumped well away from the fray. Teton. Minimizing electric sphere, he said calmly. A thin layer of iron formed from the surface of the earth underneath all of the loyalists and caught them like a net. In a span of time much too short for any of those captured even to shout in surprise or panic, the net's ends met to form a huge, metallic ball large enough to fit all of them. It hovered ominously above the now completely bare ground it had even captured Iso. Tengoku landed on the same roof on which Naruto stood, his master making hand signs. Raiden. Grand splicing current, he whispered. A powerful wave of lightning hit the dome full on. Thousands of stuttered screams rang out within the giant ball, along with a sharp noise accompanied by a large dent. The lieutenant general hurriedly clenched his fist, making the huge ball condense in the blink of an eye but Iso struck the wall again at the last second, green chakra glowing in his hand and a cloak of wind surrounding his entire body as he jumped out, 
leaving every one of his comrades to perish as the ball which contained all of them was soon the size of a speck of dust. Woo! Now that was a close call, amigo. Really gets the blood pumping, am I right? So fucking annoying. Looks like it's just you and me now, clown. No more holding back. He ran forward and jumped onto the roof with Naruto while Tengoku flew upward. Go find my team. I think they ran off to the market district in the southeast. He yelled into the eerily empty night as he jumped away from his pursuer. The phoenix solemnly nodded and flew off. The younger man began to throw iron senbon, continuing to create new ones from his left and throwing with his right. This more irritated Iso than anything, which was clear on his face as he used copious futon jutsu to deflect the pestilent weapons. But instead of simply continuing on past him, the dozens of senbon turned around in midair, drawn by a magnetic force, and flew back toward the pink clad man, successfully piercing a shadow clone. Predictable, the rebel mentally mused. He sent a scythe of futon behind him, which I saw this time the real one, his sensor abilities told him regrettably blocked with a futon wave of his own. This is boring, I so yelled. Naruto grudgingly had to agree. Let's have fun. Naruto grunted in disapproval. Sweden, jagged ripples. Water combined in a pool above the lieutenant general, impressive in its scale, then rained down sharp spikes. But the Teton user was too fast he recharged his lightning cloak which gave him speed almost too great to track with the naked eye, and he easily got out of the wide, perilous field. He made another run at his enemy, but this time made eye contact seconds before reaching him. The general thought, for the briefest of seconds, that his legs were no longer underneath him. He fell and looked down, enough of an illusionary distraction for him to be off guard and suffer a powerful kick to the face from an oncoming Naruto. He fell to his back, prostrate on the ground, but the pain broke the illusion. He was rolling around on the ground holding his face in his hands, presumably in pain from the lightning-enhanced strike, as the rebel moved to kick him again while he was down. Iso, however, was feigning his pain, and shot a beam of fire without a hand sign at an unsurprised Naruto's face, and the younger man evaded it effortlessly and summoned an iron spike from underneath Iso to impale him. But the man willed his way out of another hole by substituting with a pile of bricks on a nearby rooftop. Sweden. Water cannon. The loyalist cried, forcing Naruto to use the full speed of his cloak as he cursed the elusiveness of this enemy. The power of that lightning enhanced punch seemed to have had no real effect. The walls of the taller building just behind him would boast remarkable, gaping holes in their stone faces for years to come as the powerful Sweden jutsu chased close behind its target. Raiden. Shadow grenades. As he ran, the Teton user bombarded his foe with lightning grenades which exploded on impact, forcing him to cancel his water cannon and use a wind wall to fend them off. However, a few of them inexplicably fell through the wall, and he turned away in preparation to jump away, expecting it to explode only for him to turn back around when it hadn't gone off and find Naruto had substituted with it and was aiming a punch at his face. This time, Iso's reflexes could not save him and he caught the strike square in the jaw, followed with blinding quickness by a barrage of punches to the gut, an uppercut knee to the chin, and a spinning roundhouse to the face the force of which would have snapped the neck of nearly anyone, sending him flailing off the rooftop and onto the ground. The pink-clad man responded by getting up and cracking his neck and knuckles. Well, that was downright adorable. All the burn marks on the older man's body from the lightning healed themselves before Naruto's eyes. Who the fuck is this guy? For just the second time in his life, he felt a horrible, foreign, paralyzing feeling the stoicism breaking slightly, the lieutenant general's heart dropping into his stomach and his breath shortening and his sweat becoming even more palpable, almost making him feel human that melted his confidence. Fear, unbridled, sudden and horrible. This man was rebuffing every one of his techniques, taking every attack as though Naruto were a headstrong genin taking on a cage and Iso was letting the boy have his moment in the sun, amusing him. As much fun as it is to see you thinking you can actually beat me, I think it's my turn now, the loyalist continued. He jumped back onto the rooftop, his hands glowing bright green, and set off against his still shocked opponent. Maybe I should retreat, wait for reinforcements. I can't take this guy. A potentially lethal punch grazed his hair as he ducked underneath. He's going to kill me. I can't die. I can't, I can't, I can't. 
He jumped back and the numbing effect of the green chakra just barely reached his stomach, frightening him even further. Then he saw his mother's face. A snowy field, white blanketing the plains, purity in spades. A beautiful woman, dark hair, milky, smooth skin, purity in spades. He sidestepped a right hook. I can't believe I let this fear overwhelm me. I can't, I can't just give up. She needs me. Her memory depends on me. I can't run. I won't die, but I won't surrender either. The memory of that angel driving him. A chakra enhanced jump away gave Naruto the time to cancel the lightning cloak and reform his envy of the samurai armor under his skin. For whatever reason, the former was utterly useless against this enemy, but now with the latter, he felt comfortable engaging his enemy in taijutsu. The two of them bounded across the rooftops and met in the air, Naruto with his two swords and Iso with his wind-enhanced tanto, the latter expecting violent sparks to fly and nearly blind them both only for Shirokage and Kurokage to cut straight through the weapon like a hot axe through butter. The rebel had been expecting this, and used that forward momentum to turn into a high back kick aimed at the shocked general's head. His otherworldly reflexes allowed him to catch the foot, ready to break the ankle, but they failed him when an iron spike from the heel pierced that hand. Fucking hell. He yelled and jumped back, trying to buy himself time to heal the wound, but his opponent refused to give it Iso was forced to fight with only one hand. Naruto leapt forward, swinging Kurokage from above and Shirokage horizontally from the left, but he substituted away and immediately summoned ten shadow clones to cover for him while he healed. The lieutenant general knew he had to take advantage of his enemy's setback, and so pulled out a foolproof jutsu, futon, thousand senbon dome. The shadow clones all dispersed immediately, but the original managed to fend it off with a powerful defensive katan jutsu which he formed with one-handed hand signs, the elemental advantage his savior. My chakra's low I'm ending this now, but I need time. He summoned an iron clone to make sure that Iso wouldn't be able to disturb the jutsu and that he didn't heal that hand. Chakra saturated the air around him as he gathered massive amounts of energy in the form of moisture, air, and static from the space around him and condensed it into a crackling blue and white cube above his head. It grew larger by the second. This Ariton attack is the ultimate game changer. I will preserve your memory, Ka Chan, I swear. Suddenly he noticed a lack of the distinct noises of battle. He looked around to find the area empty. Where was his clone? And more importantly, where was? His answer jumped through the roof on which Naruto stood with reckless abandon, appearing right in front of him. The younger man didn't have time to think before a fist laced heavily with green chakra sent him flying dozens of yards through taller buildings nearby. He finally crunched to a stop at the side of a tall, brick watchtower. Damn, he's, strong, he thought as he fell fifteen feet to the ground, landing on his face. The potent mixture of blood and spinal fluid from his broken skull had already reached his lips. Bile might have risen in his throat, had he not already tasted it so many times before. This is was the greatest weakness of his envy of the samurai armor. There wasn't enough muscle mass on his face for the iron to flow through, leaving his head vulnerable. Or at least that was his best theory, since he still did not truly understand his keke jenke, despite all the anatomical study he had forced himself to undergo. So there he lay on the paved stone road, with sweat and blood and skull juice leaking down his face. A chilly night breeze bit him, and there was Iso. Naruto was floating in and out of consciousness he couldn't for the life of him control his chakra. Just, one hit, was all it took. I told, Aogai, you CK with M. Iso's voice faded in and out as he slipped between two worlds. What am I even doing here? The pick-clad general picked him up off the ground. Why am I still so weak? He ran up the side of the watchtower still carrying his semi-conscious burden. Were all those years a waste? Iso was soon at the top, Casting his gaze out at the empty weight, his eyes saw something they clearly did not like, and he hurried to complete his current objective. I've been lying to myself and to Ka Chan for my entire life, I broke my promise, and now I'll die here without anyone caring. He threw Naruto off the dizzying heights of the watchtower, the younger man flailing pathetically as he sailed without control. Except, Haku, Haku. The older one charged his hand with green chakra and dove after and struck his back with the fullest power he could muster. Naruto flew into the earth with enough force to make a massive crater open up in the ground underneath him. I know I can't go where you are, Ka-chan, but, 
I hope Haku Chan can. He closed his eyes, beyond pain, beyond feeling, beyond hated, beyond love. He could not find himself anymore. There was nothing left to find. Do you know what it means? A sweet scented breeze, such a quotidian thing, taken for granted by so many. But one person, at least, could appreciate the sough of a summer breeze in an otherwise silent place and let the halcyon scene sink softly, surreptitiously, into her every sense. An orange hue intermittently dotted with purple and a deep red spanned the skyline, gazing powerfully over the tree line thick with evergreen pines. She liked to think that this was the work of some higher being, the beautiful result of a paintbrush of incomprehensible magnitude making its grand strokes across the heavens. Nature was the only flawless thing in the world. What but a perfect, intelligent being could have designed it? These thoughts comforted her when she felt the weight of armies bearing down on her shoulders, when she took the lives of her enemies with questionable motives driving her, and when her allies dropped like flies in the suffocating horror of battle. She would always look for the brushstrokes, and she always managed to find them, even in the deepest pits of hopelessness and terror. After all, if there truly was a god, then goodness must be attainable, a goal to be achieved, not an unachievable dream. If goodness existed, then so could peace, and all the sacrifices of so many dead would not be in vain. Paridolia though it may have been, she had no one close to comfort her, no family, no lover, no true, close friend to confide in, so she allowed herself some room for imagination. It was only a few minutes of silence, of true, inner wholeness, but that was all Mei Terumi could ask for. Ow, with that cursed stolen by a Kugan, could find her anywhere so here he was, chasing her to the desolate, remote, rocky outcropping on which she sat. Mei Shusho, I finally found you. The troops are gathering supplies there are a few more logistics to be taken care of before we can move. They're all very anxious to leave this place and move on Soza, so it should not be too long. Of course they are. Many of them are young. They don't understand what it's like out there in battle. No story or historical account can possibly accurately inform them of what is to come. Correct. But their confidence and morale are high, thanks to the victories of second and third companies. We'll see how morale stands once they've stained their clothes with the blood of hundreds and thousands. A contemplative pause. Speaking of victories, second company have arrived at Tantatsu, yes. Have they made any moves against Ranso and Kanchi? Not that we're aware of, which is surprising, considering they've been there for a few weeks now and Kisame Hoshigaki and Zabuza Momochi, of all people, are leading that company. In any case, we must be off now, Mei Shusho. She nodded. Yes, of course. Only a few minutes passed before they were back in downtown Atari, where soldiers were running in and out of hotel and apartment buildings, where they slept, and courthouses and gymnasiums, where equipment and provisions were stored. From grizzled Jonin of age 40 to fresh Jenin, barely 12 not much younger than Naruto, she thought, the realization absolutely mind-boggling, but at the same time so, so, so very much younger everyone's arms were full of various necessities, imperishable food ration bars, food pills sealing scrolls, kanai and the like. May managed to subdue her tendency to take control and stretch herself thin by attempting to take on every task alone, convincing herself that her officers were handling everything and that there was, in fact, a method to all this madness. Ao led her through the densely packed downtown district, its foreboding high-rise buildings stretching toward the sky in vain attempts to scrape the stars. These buildings strongly recalled the architectural style of a megacure, and for good reason during the Second Great War. A large percentage of the population of that land fled to escape the insufferable carnage ravaging their homeland and ended up in this eastern area of Mizu no Kuni, which was, at the time, sparsely populated. So the settlers, hearkening back to their fatherland, constructed buildings in that style. May wondered why they found the need to build their edifices so damn high then again, perhaps it was the human condition, always wishing to better themselves without regard to the potential consequences. It only took a few thousand years after the Tower of Babylon for mankind to once again try their luck at reaching God but, for whatever reason, this time he wasn't trying to stop them. Or she chuckled, as, if there truly existed an omniscient, omnipotent God, this must be the case he knew that now, mankind was powerful and evil enough to destroy themselves before any really threatening effort could be made. Indeed, here they were destroying themselves, not just man killing man which is sordid enough but countrymen killing countrymen, brother killing brother. And she was the leader of the whole affair, 
the prime mover, as it were, the guiltiest of all. But it was worth it right. It occurred to her how silly the idea was that years of bloodshed, thousands killed, was worth it if it meant that the deaths of other thousands would end. She told herself often that what she was doing was for the greater good, but, in reality, she knew very well that more people would die in this civil war than ever would have died had the Keke Jenke purges been allowed to continue. Those deaths were cruel, unjust but, in the grand scheme of things, did it matter? Is it worse for a serial killer to 10 people or for 15 to commit suicide? The former were killed as a result of an evil, unjust act, while the latter chose to die but in the end, five more people lost their lives forever, so how could the former be better? She shook her head in an attempt to forcibly remove the philosophical questions from her head. At any rate, she was far too deep in this to stop. If she were to quit now, even more people would die, which would certainly not happen on her watch. The brisk stroll to the command tent was taking Ian's. The chaos was overwhelming. The fact that nearly every soldier who saw her would drop what they were doing to salute her sure, she appreciated the show of respect only exacerbating the situation. She had learned long ago that to keep an air of professionalism, one must ignore the salutes as though they were not there, so she pressed on at an awkwardly slow pace without a thought of them. To avoid slipping into a state of ennui, which would also be unprofessional, she considered why they were in the state they were in, so tightly packed together, hardly able to breathe for lack of oxygen in the narrow streets of Atari. Not for the first time, she wondered how the loyalists could have passed up such an incredible opportunity military officers dreamed of having a place like this to defend. One would be hard-pressed to find a better place in the world to set up an ambush with its thin roads and tall buildings and countless dead ends. May would guess that a skilled, well-organized group one-sixth the size of the attackers would be able to effectively defend this city. So why would the loyalists abandon the place altogether and leave it for their enemies? No matter how much she meditated on it, nothing plausible came to mind. This frightened her more than anything. May was not an exceptionally patient person, and was soon fed up with stumbling blindly about in the crowd, constantly tripping on Ao's feet, so she used a chakra-enhanced jump to propel herself onto the side of the nearest building, then ran up and navigated the rooftops. Technically, she could just use her chakra to run along the sides of the edifices, but the mere thought of jumping sideways in midair made her head spin. Ao saw this, figured it was a good idea, and was about to follow when he heard someone calling him among the deafening cacophony. Ao Ippen. I got a message needs delivering. Indeed, the blue patch on the breast of the young man's armor identified him as a messenger not very skilled in the way of combat, but bearing speed and stamina to a point that it almost did not matter. He shoved his way through the crowd to his superior, who immediately placed a hand on his shoulder and lifted them onto a nearby rooftop with a shunshun. Surprisingly, the messenger was not caught off guard. Clearly this was quite routine for him. Did you run into bandits on your way? The superior asked. Depends do wolves count as bandits? Ao nodded the messenger was legitimate, knew the passphrase. Report, soldier. I'm afraid this message is to be delivered directly to Mei Shusho. I only approached you to ask whether you were aware of her current location. Directly to her? Ha. Huh. Okay. What company sent you? Second. And your superiors? Hoshigaki Ippin, Zabuza Ippin and Uchiha Sama all agreed that I should settle only with reporting directly to her. That is unacceptable, the second in command asserted, his tone brooking no argument. There is proper protocol for transferring messages for a reason. I understand that, but, but nothing. Mondo is the postmaster here, you'll find him in the courthouse. Ow Ippin, you are being a dundridge, the younger man seed. I insist you allow me to see her. The older one violently grabbed his collar and got in his face. Listen here, kid, he seed. You are nothing to me. I could have you locked up for insubordination right now if I wanted. But you won't, will you, because that would look awfully suspicious one second company heard, the boy unflinchingly answered without missing a beat. After a tense pause, I'm more than willing to take the risk if it means protecting my commander, Ao answered and released the messenger. If I hear of you coming anywhere near her, I swear to you, he released some key to prove his point, there will be hell to pay. As steel-nerved as the younger man was, he knew better than to commit blatant insubordination. His second company's superiors had only told him to try, as they had expected it to be disallowed, so they would not be displeased with him. He bowed in legitimate respect. As you wish, Ao Ippin, 
he answered and jumped away. The lieutenant general of first company let out a heavy sigh of relief, he'd have to keep an eye on that one. A few hours passed before everything had fallen into place. The soldiers were in proper formation to move out, forming a gigantic square around the baggage train, which traveled on the paved highway leading directly to the railroad, to protect the vulnerable but extremely valuable equipment. The thick forest on either side of the road made it difficult to maintain formation, but the best efforts were made. The outermost line of the multi-layered square was charged with focusing all their attention on sniffing out any hidden enemies, after a certain time interval, the lines would rotate. May did not truly expect an ambush. The enemy had no way to know when they were leaving, and advance scouts had informed her that no loyalist camps were in the area. Leaving a sizable force to stay in the same spot near Atari on the off chance the rebels might leave soon would have been foolish, impractical many of the loyalist generals might have been cruel, but they weren't stupid. But she used the four corners formation anyway, because in war, caution preceded all. In most cities, railroads held their termini within major cities such as Atari, but, for a reason May could not for the life of her put her finger on, this line found its end twenty miles without the metropolis. Moving all those troops with all that baggage was painstakingly slow going, so it was nightfall by the time they reached the old station. The place was remarkably decrepit, especially considering its importance to the city of Atari. It was a wholly concrete structure made up of basic rectangles the pragmatic architecture of Yugura's regime, as railroads were a relatively new invention. This drew a stark contrast to that of Atari's, the ominous, cloud-grazing skyscrapers, and that of older, western Mizu no Kuni, based largely in concentric circles, the pinnacle of elegance, May's favorite. Other than dozens of loyalist sympathetic posters plastered on every wall, Yugura-sama, the liberator, they brazenly proclaimed under a flattering photo of the diminutive despot. The place lacked any decoration, a shallow box clearly meant only to provide relief from harsh weather. Then there were the trains themselves. A grand total of twenty lines ran through here, a powerful reminder that Atari was the fourth largest city in the country. Six stretching out into infinity toward the northwest, to Soza, six southwest to Mezo, eight west to Kirigakir. Every one of the Kiri lines was empty suggesting the civilians had escaped westward, while there were four trains remaining in each of the other two directions this might suggest that enemy troops had split up, but there was no way to know for sure, so she put no stock in it. In their haste to leave, the loyalists had performed as much sabotage on the remaining trains as they could cutting links between cars, toppling many of the cars themselves, burying the coal furnaces in mounds of damp salt. It took nearly all of the many weeks the company spent in Atari for rebel engineers to haul the locomotives out of disrepair, but they had worked with admirable efficiency and speed to complete their task within the window. So first company pile onto the vehicles, willingly driving themselves directly into the terrible jaws of death. The plan was to stop 15 miles outside Soza, as, even if the enemy was expecting them, no company could survive in the bare plains that far out from the city for two months. May settled into the head cabin of the second car from the front with all of her top officers. The presidential car was homely and quaint. Glass chandeliers, fine silverware, tablecloths, wide aisles between rich leather booths, the epitome of elegance. The commander-in-chief chose to take a window seat and watch the countryside of the land she was willing to die for silently scroll by. The hours dragged on. Outside, forests begat rich land peopled generously with hillocks, which begat plain, yellow savannas, which begat an awful memory of times past, an area spanning hundreds of square miles between Atari and Soza which Kumo soldiers had burned and salted during the Third Great War. This area was now called the Salt Desert, cruel, unforgiving, utterly uninhabitable land and she bit back a memory, one tied to this land, and tied to every well-meaning inquiry about why she was alone. Such a shame, a voice across from her said, and May realized that she hadn't even noticed him enter the booth, how long had he been there wallowing in silence, thinking she was ignoring him? It was a newly minted military adviser, his sandy, shaggy hair nearly reaching his eyes, neatly framing the green orbs, admittedly a handsome man around her age. I remember living in plains like these were before as a kid. They were beautiful. We grew wheat. I have a very similar story, although, she drifted off, casting a regretful gaze through the window but not onto a land onto an unforeseeable coincidence still clawing at her conscience dozens of years later. You wouldn't like to relive it. 
I understand. I'm Noboru, by the way. I haven't been formally introduced yet, but I'm. Kosu's replacement, I know. It stung her to think that the stubborn but lovable old Dundridge had died before the first battle, of something as ridiculous as pneumonia. She wondered if she regretted that Kosu the person was gone, or that his skills were gone what had she become that she knew it was the latter. Yeah, Kosu's replacement. Never got the chance to meet him, but heard he was a great guy. He was. The man perceived her as being in no mood for small talk, but pushed for it anyway. You know, I'm surprised someone like you turned out to be a ninja. Anyone else might have immediately assumed it was about sex and been immediately offended, but the commander-in-chief could not imagine one of her subordinates saying something so stupid directly to her face, if at all, so she hesitated to take it as such. How do you mean? Well, he said with a shy chuckle, normally ladies as beautiful as you become actresses or models, not shinobi. May couldn't suppress a blush. She could not for the life of her recall the last time a man had complimented her looks. All of them with the exception, apparently, of this one were far too frightened of a woman listed in every hidden village's bingo book as S rank. I'm sure I'm the hundredth one to tell you this, but you're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen, he said with a cheeky smile with his hand on the back of his head, and I figured one more time couldn't hurt. She giggled at how forward he was. Transparency was so hard to come by in the shinobi world, especially when one was as high up in the ranks as she was, so she could certainly appreciate it. You'd be surprised, then, at how rare this is. See, when you get to my age and you're leading an entire army, men tend to be pretty evasive. His hearty laughter was the kind that could make everyone listening joyful. With each second that passed, Mei was growing to like Noboru more. I guess that makes sense, but when I see an angel, no matter what position she's in, I'm going to maw. She ducked. He wasn't so lucky. The barrage of Kanai crashing through the window simultaneously pierced his head, slit his throat and severed his jugular, leaving his handsome head an unrecognizable lump which landed under the table right in front of May, forcing her to stare into the eyes of the man she might have loved. Before she could feel panic, fear, pain, or disgust, an explosion from underneath catapulted the car dozens of feet off the track. The tumble sent her flying across the cabin. Her head slammed against a sharp edge before she could find her balance, her consciousness fading away from a scene too horrible for screams. Naruto's awakening was a sudden one one second he was just leaving the REM cycle, the next he was wide awake, just as he had learned from all those years in his prison. The shinobi's greatest fear, his fiercest enemy, was not the man on the battlefield across from him or the most powerful cage. It was time. The only battle that would always inevitably be lost, no matter the amount of chakra or training, was the one against time. Even the sage himself lost that fight. He faced a large window, the sun casting an amorphous, ever-shifting curtain of light onto his entire body projected through the thick leaves of the maple just outside. The walls were plain, white, just like the sheets and the pillow and the clothes he had been changed into and the IV hooked into him. In fact, the only color within his current plane of vision belonged to a lovely arrangement of yellow tulips on the nightstand by his bed. A voice gentle as a breeze caressed his ears. Naruto-kun? Are you awake? Haku rose from the chair behind where her lover was facing, hurrying to the other side of the bed to meet his gaze, which he weakly returned. She heaved a sigh of relief followed immediately by tears of joy as she kissed his cheek somewhere approaching ten million times. He was still mustering his energy. After a few minutes, he managed to sit up and look out on the rest of the small room. There was, nobody. Nobody here to see him but Haku, the only woman he truly loved. He considered for a second that seemed a strange sentence. He had love, but, yes, it must be for her. Why was he even questioning that? How strange. Hi. Haku Chan, he whispered weakly. Where am? And suddenly it all flooded in, and his last memory surfaced, his voice freezing in his throat and his heart skipping a beat. He was about to leap out of the bed when he caught himself, looked at the girl he loved, it was already over. Iso was long gone, the fight was over, and he had lost. Despondency swallowed him and he sunk within himself for his failure. Seeing his despair, she climbed under the covers with him deftly avoiding the IV and his more sensitive areas. Baby, you did so incredibly. You took out the entire loyalist force on Senma almost by yourself I so only beat you because you were so tired. My team, are fine. They're with the rest of the company. 
She saw the question forming on his lips, on the way to Anaka. They all wanted to stay to look after you, you know. Naruto simply made an affirmative noise. She knew the information from Jay would be a pick-me-up. Iso was a candidate for Mizukage. You know the only reason why he didn't get it and Yugura did was because of Iso being too volatile. You went toe-to-toe -to -toe with a cage-level shinobi. Also, you've made it in the Kiri Bingo book as S rank. They're calling you the Iron Terror, and K's Cage is Bastard, because of your lightning cloak, which is pretty pejorative, but cool at the same time. His eyes widened he was only 13, and he had faced off against a cage and lived. Imagine how strong he would be at 18, or 20, or 30, and Haku was happy, because Naruto wasn't sad, and Naruto was everything. So where are we? And is it just you? He finally asked, coming back to himself. We're back on Ohm. This is the only place safe enough to have kept you for such a long time. And yeah, it's just us two J figured that leaving a regiment would only slow us down when you were prepared to go, but he couldn't afford to make the assault without Hawk, Robin and Finch. And I kinda begged him to let me. Wait, he's launching the assault on Anaka without me. They'll be screwed, that's a huge naval depot. Well, they should be attacking tomorrow, so, so we have to go. He began to throw the blankets off before Haku grabbed him and held him back. Cut it out right now. You're still in no shape to go anywhere, much less fight a battle. Actually, a white coated doctor said as he stepped in clutching a clipboard, You're in excellent physical shape. Your recovery has been no less than miraculous in only two weeks, you're in better shape than anyone else would have been in two months. You could fight a war right now if you weren't so tired. I can't help but notice that you felt the need to insert the word, physical, in that prognosis, the young man observed. A sharp one yes, that's the bad news. In the fight, you suffered massive trauma to the temporal lobe of your cerebrum, the region of the brain associated with. Perception and recognition of auditory stimuli, memory and speech, I know. Haku couldn't help but smile at the doctor's surprise. But obviously my speech is fine my hearing flawless, and, as Haku-chan can attest, my memory is intact as always. I don't doubt that if the rest of your healing is any testimony, you aren't affected by injury as others are. It also didn't hurt that you had a master field medic on hand if it weren't for him, you'd probably be drooling on yourself in a wheelchair, eating through a tube. Sorry for the harsh honesty. I'd thank him when I got the chance if I were you. Robin. He owed him his life. Naruto had never had to depend on someone else before. He didn't know the meaning of an apology, never received one, never given one. What a strange feeling, indebtedness. He despised it and settled on never experiencing it again. Even if you feel fine, I'll need to conduct a few tests. Of course. After 20 minutes of pointing lights and probes in odd places, the doctor heaved a sigh and pulled away. All right. Everything looks good. You'll feel stiffness in your back for a few weeks and headaches will come and go for the same amount of time, but other than that, just get plenty of sleep for the next few days. It's Tuesday we'll shoot for a release on Friday. I trust you can show him to the facilities in the cafeteria. He asked, nodding to Haku, who signaled an affirmative back. Excellent. I'll have a nurse come by and get you off the IV soon enough. You're good to go. If you have any questions, just hit that yellow button. Get well and thank you for your service. Thank you. Haku answered just before he ducked out, then turned to Naruto, who was pleased enough with the news. Things could have been much, much worse. I'm so glad you're okay, she said, another tear threatening to grace her soft cheeks. I was so worried. The ebony haired boy turned his head to share a long, sweet kiss with her, one she cherished every second of. You've got nothing to be worried about, Haku chan. I'll always be around, I can't die knowing you're still out there. You're what kept me going, you know. Uncertainty clouded his eyes after he said that, but Haku was too obsessed with the sweetness of what he'd said to notice. She was what he thought of when he was in life threatening danger. Yes. She gave him strength. Naruto winced as she hugged him even more tightly. Perhaps he was growing too quixotic for his own good. The air was thick with dust, blood, shrieking, the insufferable boom of shrapnel cannons, such was the scene that Mei awoke to. Ao shaking her as a medic nin poured green chakra over the gaping wound that had opened up in her head, doing an admirable job of staying under control despite the circumstances. Voices faded in and out of audibility, until finally the medic declared her condition stable and released the narcotic medical ninjutsu, 
which shielded the patient from pain but greatly impaired their sense of awareness. Ao's shouting suddenly became clear as he picked her up, ambush. Ambush. It seemed the Doden users had thought quickly they stood in a ditch roughly six feet deep as cannon fire, mounted kanai launchers and hand-thrown kanai laced with explosive tags bombarded them. May peeked over the top of the mound to see that all four trains had been blown to bits by remotely set off, pre-planted explosive tags. She idly wondered how many had died in the first attack, then frowned as she remembered Noboru. But there was no time for memories on the battlefield. Casualties? She snapped to her right-hand man. Best estimate is about 2,000 already, and rapidly increasing, mom. She snarled what a hopeless situation, to be surrounded on both sides by heavy cannons and no doubt outnumbered by a massive margin. We only have one option. Have the Doden users fortify this trench only slightly for now, wait until they run out of cannon ammunition and attempt to make a charge, then immediately and I mean immediately, how we deploy fortification plan alpha. Understood? If I may ask then what, may shusho? We pray to Kami that we can get a message to Naruto since he's the only one close enough he should be recovered by now before he leaves to rejoin his company. The element of surprise is our only hope at this point. If we can't, and her eyes were stone cold, piercing through Ao's, her voice dripping with a foreboding prophecy itching to manifest itself, first company will be forced to make a last stand at Oko Railroad, and history will not remember that there ever was a Kiri civil war. Ao, send for runner Beta right now. The trip to Ohm is not a short one by foot, we have to move now, before Naruto leaves to rejoin third company. Mei yelled over the shrieks of cannonballs and kanai exploding and shooting over their heads at hundreds of miles per hour. Her right-hand man nodded and quickly ran in the opposite direction, shoving people aside to get by in the narrow, hastily formed and fortified trench. Several minutes after Mei had issued the order, Ao had gathered the messenger and directed him to her. They truly did come in all shapes and sizes, just like the entire rebel army and the only sign of his unique occupation was a yellow ribbon painted across the left shoulder of his otherwise identical uniform. He wore a completely red mask messengers in particular required hidden identities. Now they crouched in the shallow dirt depression like one giant grave serving as their trench, and May struggled to yell loudly enough for the man to hear her. This is an extremely urgent message you're sending, an S-rank mission with SS-rank urgency you know what that means. You're headed to Ohm Island, and you better haul ass there because Naruto Ippon could leave at any time. If he's not still there when you arrive, he'll be on the way back to Anaka, so chase him down immediately. Once you get a hold of him, relate our situation and proceed to run back this way without hesitation. With his powers, he's the only one who can save us. Understood. He nodded in response. Ow, inform the men that on my signal they are all to throw two smoke bombs in various directions. You'll have this cover but I'm sending a team to hold off the men they'll almost certainly send after you. Decide your route now. He nodded again, and Ao ran off. The commander turned to Chojuro, waiting patiently as ever by her side. They're going to send their best hunter nins after him. Assault teams Alpha, Beta and Gamma should be tied up on the right and left flanks, so bring me Delta. I need to send the smallest number possible I think they can buy enough time. The enemy will be sending big numbers, and I know I'm putting them all in a very difficult position but... But nothing. She knew perfectly well she was sending them all to their deaths, people with families and friends that cared for them and loved them. Every one of these decisions still hurt, still kept her up at night, but she had yet to regret a single one. Situations like this didn't require any real thought. The choice was clear, to sacrifice the few for the many. Indeed, logically, the decision was obvious, but emotionally, it was devastating. Mei Shusho. Here they are, Chojuro yelled. Mei hadn't even noticed he had left, she was so lost in thought. The top assault teams functioned in wartime the same way Anbu did in peacetime, and so kept their masks in order to preserve their identities, as opposed to Hawk, Robin and Finch, who held standardized positions within the traditional parameters of a military and fought alongside regular troops, at least for the most part, this team of four were true lone wolves, trusting no one but their team but following every order to the letter even the one they knew would be the death of them. May always hated this talk, but knew they would all take it like the emotionless machines they had been trained to be. Your objective is to buy this messenger some time so he can report to Naruto Ippon. 
you will go with this messenger, Salamander, and hold off the enemy forces that will almost inevitably attempt to chase you down. She took a deep breath, taking turns looking each one of them as she said icily, I cannot guarantee that any of you will come out of this alive. I would almost call it a suicide mission, to be quite frank. If you succeed it will mean the salvation of the rebellion. If you fail, I won't mince words, it will mean the slaughter of every one of your comrades. The fate of the entire nation of Kiri rests on your shoulders. But I believe more than anything that you're ready. The second the smoke bombs go up, hit that tree line. Got it? Three distinct types of responses met her. The hardened, grizzled veteran, more than ready for the longest time to die her heroic death and be done with it all, gave her an immediate, understanding and silent nod. Another, the overzealous young man who was so impassioned about saving his homeland that he was willing to throw his life away if it meant a greater chance of his chosen cause succeeding, or who put all stock in honor and glory and saw this as his best shot at it, answered with an ardent, hi, may shusho. But still others, the other type of young, conflicted between their duties and the knowledge they were too young to die and who wanted to stay alive and experience all the beautiful things this world had for them, returned her question by staring down at the dirt and contemplating their commander's words with a strong pang of fear. And May's heart broke for them, not because it was her fault they were here and she knew it and they knew it and their families knew it, but because the jaws of death were about to consume one more frightened soul that they didn't have to consume and she was yet again powerless to stop it. She half hoped the overwhelming guilt would stop one day, and sure, it had thinned, but May knew that the day she put no thought into sending her people to their deaths would be the day she would no longer be human would be the day she would transform into a monster. A monster like Naruto. The Anbu were now leaving to head to the southeasternmost point in the trench. Two in particular stuck especially close together, simply stealing glances as they shoved through the sights, smells and sounds of comrades crying out curses for their missing appendages and the organs spilling out of their torsos. Somewhere around the 17th such sight, the shorter one with the long, tan hair stopped the taller one with the dark hair with a hand on the shoulder. Kirito-kun, I'm scared, she admitted once he drew nearer and had a hand on each of her arms. Hey, look at me, he said, and she picked up her head to meet his gray eyes. I swear I'll keep you safe, Asuna-chan. I swear it on my life that, no matter what, you'll walk off this battlefield alive. She rolled her eyes. I don't care about me, you baka. It's, it's you I'm worried about. The man couldn't suppress a smile. He had known that was her worry after all, she was no coward. We've been through plenty and come out just fine, he assured her only half certainly. There's nothing different about this one. Did you hear what Mei Shusho said? She even admitted it was a suicide mission. He sighed. She was completely right. What guarantees could he make? Hey. Their captain yelled, having turned and seen them stalling. Cat. Boar. Get your asses over here, this is no time to dilly dally. Kirito cringed. Who the fuck says dilly dally anymore? Tycho is ancient. He snuck in one last thing. Keep your head on a swivel and we'll get out of this perfectly safe and sound. We have to do it. For the little one, he said as he gently placed his hand on her stomach. He lifted her mask to see her smiling, but with a tear running down her face. An explosive tag went off nearby but they remained unfazed as their lips met. They hurriedly ran off to meet their team, because their country needed them, and there was nothing so important. Nothing at all. Assault Team Delta and Runner Beta stood crouched behind the point in the trench closest to the part of the tree line leading to the route the messenger had chosen. The loyalists had clearly expected them to be there for quite a while and had come very prepared they had yet to run out of ammunition for their Kanai launchers and shrapnel cannons despite having fired non-stop for hours, but they had recently begun firing only in waves, presumably for the sake of conservation, in other words, it was the perfect chance for them to make it in one piece. Kirito could feel the sweat collecting in his gloves. He tried not to think about the number of troops they'd send after them, but he guessed it would be above 100. He took a deep breath and released it slowly, he was Anbu. He had done plenty of life-threatening missions in his sleep. This was no different, he and Asuna would come out of this bumped and bruised, but safe, just like always. As long as he could keep her safe, he didn't care what happened. He hoped she would move past his death eventually, but knew it wasn't likely she would. He had to survive so that his absence wouldn't hang over his family forever, so that he could be there for his child he wanted his kid to have a dad and his grandkids to have a grandpa. 
During a time of held fire, a lava grenade was lobbed into the air, spawning a number of child grenades which went off dozens of feet high in a grand display akin to fireworks. Without hesitation, the entire army let fly a smoke grenade each, a thick, opaque cloud forming in every direction around the trench. The enemy now had a decision to make they could assume the rebels were making a charge under the cover, and open fire for the several minutes it would take for the smoke to clear, but potentially waste ammo if it was just a diversion, or wait to see the first rebel emerge from the smoke before firing. The silence choking the air meant they had chosen the latter, so the five made their move with a quick shunshun. The air was perfectly still as they ran. Kirito could hear nothing but his own heavy breathing, his footsteps accenting the harsh pounding of his heartbeat. He looked sidelong at Asuna, who gave him a reassuring nod. They were nearly at the tree line now, and they had yet to fire a shot. Maybe everything would be okay, after all. A bellowing shout made him pick his head up, the sight paralyzing his heart. The enemy general cried out to a small piece of them to give chase, since, evidently, they weren't worth the ammo. Then again, small, was relative. Their numbers were well over 200. It was hopeless. Upon hitting the tree line they broke off directly southeast. They only traveled a few miles into the thick forest before the five of them stopped. We can't waste too much energy running away or we'll be useless, the team leader, a thirty-something-year-old woman with green hair code named Tigress, decided. You go on ahead, Salamander. We'll buy you plenty of time, don't worry we'll buy you plenty of time. The messenger ran off without hesitation. Now he could travel at full speed those damned Anbu had been holding him back. Tigress stretched out her senses. They had a few minutes, tops. All right, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, team. This is what you've been training for your whole lives. The entire fate of this war rests on our shoulders. Failure is less of an option than it's ever been. Ambush protocol B, ASAP. She never was much a speaker. Asuna thought sarcastically as she fell into position and laid out dozens of feet of ninja wire with practiced elegance. They worked in utter silence. She stretched out her senses as she finished up it was time. Before falling into her position, she caught Kirito's gaze one last time. He lifted his mask so that his mouth was visible and mouthed a word that she was unable to make out. But by the time she'd resolved to pursue it, he was already running further away, his back turned to her. There's no time. She only just had time to leap into her chosen ambush spot when the first enemies appeared on the horizon. Their numbers were daunting, to be sure, but their recklessness was just as obvious. Their superiors had whipped them past reason, knowing that if any message got away they'd greatly risk giving up this incredible opportunity to obliterate the rebels, so they ran right into the ambush without even thinking to check for a trap. On top of being insufferably headstrong, they most probably assumed there hadn't been sufficient time to lay one. Clearly these loyalists knew nothing about Assault Team Delta. The first trip Ninja Wire triggered a seal set to unload dozens of kanai at a lethal velocity. The resulting hail killed several of the unsuspecting enemy and injured quite a few others unable to escape due to the cramped nature of the thick forest and their comrades unknowingly trapping them. Now the loyalists were in utter disarray, suddenly realizing the unfortunate spot they were in and desperately searching for the well-hidden enemy. The second tripped line set off poison gas, successfully killing off most of the lower level ninja who had not learned a jutsu to ward the stuff off. It was a sickening sight. The poison, once it entered the respiratory system, heated up to the point of melting the victim's lungs from the inside out. It often got their eyes as well. They hadn't had time to set up any more, so the real attack came now. Kirito observed carefully from his camouflaged spot in a tree dozens of yards back. If it was timed right. Hornet, the fourth team member, jumped out from cover and shot a wall of water spears at the confused enemy, taking out a number of them. Boar watched him immediately be chased down by a sizable chunk of the enemy, a chunk far too large for one man when three more were still around, just as the plan had predicted. He spared his teammate no worry. Hornet was far quicker than anyone chasing him, and just as elusive. Refocusing on the task in front of him, Kirito numbered roughly 100 not including the injured writhing about on the ground like pitiful worms. He cringed upon noticing that only three of them had the compassion or lack of bloodlust to aid their dying comrades, most of whom were screaming in pain. The loyalists had now formed a rough circle in reluctant recognition of the fact that, despite their numbers, they were on the defensive. Their fear was readily apparent. The highest ranking among them, 
a centurion who seemed like barely a Jonin, began barking out half-hearted orders for them to split up and search in different directions but was promptly overrun by several inferiors who argued that such a strategy would be the very worst one to employ in this scenario. An intelligent and extroverted Chunin came forward and suggested they simply keep running after the messenger and force the rebels to come to them. After all, there certainly hadn't been enough time to set up more traps than the ones they'd tripped just then. Confidence in their new plan propelled the party of loyalists forward, while Kirito cursed under his breath. Had that centurion not been so weak-willed, this would have been a lot easier. So they shot off, and Delta Team's backup plan fell into place. Bohr swung around the back of the now mobile unit, being careful to mask his chakra signature as he hopped silently across the branches after them. He formed a seemingly harmless clone and ordered it into the middle of the pack. Shit. Get him. A common genin roared upon sight of the Kirito double, and raised his kanai along with many of his comrades. Unfortunately for them, the Jonin, leader, didn't even have time to turn his head before bloody chunks of limbs and torsos ended up stained on every oak from the sheer force of Boar's explosive clone. The centurion gulped as he surveyed the remains of several of his men and continued to run, abandoning the numerous injured ones. He was so not cut out for this. To be continued. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next part.